Here you go. Good afternoon. On behalf of the American Geographical Society Council, our members and the staff, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this sixth Location Tech Task Force Living Panel, Legal Perspectives on Location Technology. To those of you participating in the conversation on WebEx and those that are watching our live stream on Facebook, great to have you joining us this afternoon. We are proud to partner our Ethical Geo Initiative with the Henry Luce Foundation to investigate the societal implications of geospatial technology and location tracking. Mobile location-based applications have become ubiquitous in our society. As all of you know, they have changed the way we live our lives in a very short period of time. There are, however, problematic and unanticipated effects of using this technology. To better understand the ethical implications of its use, we have provided this platform to frame the discussion to address these issues as they are already impacting our lives on a daily basis. COVID-19 has put a spotlight on the concept of using mobile tracing and surveillance to fight the pandemic. Around the world, the utilization of this technology to fight the coronavirus is being employed to various degrees, and already governments and people worldwide are faced with the issue of compromised privacy and what that means as we go forward. Over the past several weeks, our first five Blue Ribbon panels met and looked at ethical implications of mobile location technology and the impact on vulnerable publics from an international perspective and from the unique American experience. In addition, we had a panel of national security leaders who focused on mobile tracing technology and its use in national security and democracy. We also heard from state and local leaders who shared their invaluable experiences with us. And just a couple of weeks ago, we looked at data quality and building trust, false negatives, false positives, and policing surveillance. In the case of all the panels, the discussions have been fascinating and comprehensive. We also had the opportunity to hear from Ambassador Samantha Power, and she added the human rights aspect of the use of mobile technology. Other leadership spotlights investigated digital contact tracing tools, as well as technology in the LGTB plus location privacy during COVID-19. Today, we turn our focus to something that will affect all of the groups we have spoken to over the past few months, and that is the legal issues involved with mobile location technology. All of this testimony we have collected through the Blue Ribbon panels and the Leadership Spotlight testimonies will serve as the basis of information and data that policymakers will use to help guide us in the future. Before we move on, I'd like to explain to those of you on our WebEx platform the best way to get the most out of today's panel. For those viewing on desktop computers or laptops, we recommend you customize your viewing by hovering the mouse in the top right of your screen and selecting the icon in the middle. During our Q&A session later, to ask a question, hover your mouse under the arrow and click on the question mark icon in the gray bar at the bottom of your screen. For those of you using a tablet or mobile device, select the icon with the three dots which will then allow you to select the question mark icon to submit your questions to our panelists. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher Tucker, the chairman of AGS and our moderator for today's session. Chris, it's a pleasure to welcome you and your panel. Thanks, John, and thanks to the team for all the, the work to uh, get this organized today. Um, AGS has a proud history of 169 years of convening government, industry, academe, and the social sector around the vital issues of the day through a geographic lens. Last year, uh, we began our Ethical Geo Initiative, looking at the ethical implications of mobile of location technologies, geospatial technologies. And with the dawn of uh, COVID-19, and our uh, we, we built a partnership with the Henry Luce Foundation, which um, has uh, created this location tech task force and the blue ribbon panels that we've convened up till now. We could not be uh, more proud to uh, have these three world experts uh, with us today. Um, and before we begin uh, their presentations, I'd like to give a short introduction of each of them. Ms. Stacy Gray, Senior Counsel at uh, Future of Privacy Forum, FPF. Uh, it focuses on issues of data collection in online and mobile platforms, ad tech, and the Internet of Things. At FPF, she has worked on FCC and FTC public filings and publishes extensive work related to cross-device tracking, smart home technologies, 
and federal privacy regulation and enforcement. She also is a certified information privacy professional. Mr. Kevin Pomfret is a partner at Williams Mullen. He represents a wide range of public and privately held companies and counsels companies on technology, joint ventures, and software and data licenses. Kevin serves as the co-chair of William Mullen's Unmanned Systems and Data, uh, and data Protection Cybersecurity Teams. As a former satellite imagery analyst in the intelligence community, Kevin is also a thought leader in geospatial technology with almost 30 years experience in the geospatial community. In addition to his legal representation, Kevin founded and is the executive director of the Center for Spatial Law and Policy. And then Mr. Jacob Snow, who is technology and civil liberties attorney at the ACLU of Northern California, where he focuses on consumer privacy, government surveillance, and the preservation of free speech online. Jake works in the courts and legislature to protect people's privacy from intrusion by both companies and the government. Before joining the ACLU of Northern California, he was staff attorney in the San Francisco office of the Federal Trade Commission. Thank you to all three of you for joining us uh, today. I know um, that you all bring uh, very valuable and very different perspectives to the table on uh, the implications of mobile location technologies in an era of COVID-19 and also for their implications beyond COVID-19. Um, uh, one of the themes that we'll have in our panel today is how new technologies, new systems, new laws, new uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, institutions are put in place in response to a particular threat and often stick around um, as we find ourselves in the face of a new one. Um, and there's, uh, we often don't have the opportunity to take the time and think through the ethical implications of those beforehand. And uh, with you three here today, I know we'll have plenty of time to reflect on all of that. So thank you again for joining us. And uh, Stacy, if you're ready, we'll um, uh, hand over the microphone to you uh, to, to kick us off. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Wonderful. Um, yeah, that, that was an amazing introduction. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thanks uh, to Ethical Geo for inviting us. Um, a quick word be before I start off, some comments and some presentation for the attendees um, on FPF and our background in working on all of this. So Future Privacy Forum is a think tank. We're based in Washington, D.C., although now we have offices in Brussels and Seattle, Washington as well. And we focus on the range of issues related to consumer privacy, specifically emerging technology and consumer privacy. So location data has been on our radar for many, many years since really the entirety of the organization's uh, history. Uh, mostly from a consumer perspective and, and especially as it relates to things like online marketing and advertising, which is at the crux of a lot of the issues I think we're going to be talking about today. Um, when the pandemic became the focus of our attention a few months ago, uh, more than that now, I guess, um, location data was also at the heart of a lot of the commercial privacy issues that we were talking about with COVID-19, right? So FPF launched a series of privacy and pandemic workshops with global leaders to talk about these issues. And I was uh, honored to be invited to participate in a paper hearing with the Senate Commerce Committee on commercial data privacy issues. And unsurprisingly, all of the questions that we received there were about location data, right? So this couldn't be more timely and important. So, so thank you. Um, we're also uh, pragmatists, I would say. We're not consumer privacy advocates like uh, my friend Jake at the ACLU, and nor are we a trade association. We try to find the center ground and the practical solution for emerging ethical and legal issues. Um, so, so all, all of that aside, um, we can maybe dive into some of the uh, some of the basics. What I thought I would do today, and maybe we'll we'll go ahead and move to the next slide. What I thought I would do with the next seven minutes or so is just a little bit first about mobile location data, uh, how it works. I think there's a there's a lot of misconceptions here about what kind of data we're talking about and who holds it and how it's collected. So I thought I would do some level setting that will hopefully be uh, helpful for the rest of the conversation. Um, and then talk a little bit about the data flows, some of the potential safeguards and safeguards that are out there and some of the risks that are out there. 
Um, and then maybe wind up um, talking a little bit about all of this in the context of COVID-19 and some of the contact tracing and exposure notification apps that we've seen around the world. So uh, first off, location data. Uh, what, there's, <laughs> there's so many misconceptions that we've seen out there. So the, the first thing that's important to understand about location data is that we're usually talking about it in the context of a mobile device, usually your cell phone, but it's not limited to that. So as we move to an Internet of Things world, as we all start buying connected vehicles and connected wearables and uh, and everything else, what we're really talking about is connected devices and the signals that those connected devices emit and receive. Um, and this is a little bit to me at the heart of what makes this such a challenging legal issue too when it comes to defining location is and when other types of data become location data. So in the context of the phone, which I think is the best place to start, some signals that the phone is receiving have known locations. So that's how GPS works, for example, GPS satellites broadcast signals and have known locations as they move through space. Cell towers broadcast their IDs and cell towers have known locations, so you can use that to triangulate location. Wi-Fi networks have been extensively mapped out through public and private efforts um, so that the reception of all of the different Wi-Fi networks that are around your neighbors, the coffee shop, the gym, um, because we know their locations, you can infer from the signal strength of those networks where a device is located. Other things like Bluetooth beacons, Bluetooth beacons are out there. Um, other signals are unknown or they're moving, right? So you're getting signals from moving devices, other people's vehicles, IoT. Um, and the signals are not limited to GPS. So increasingly we're talking about Wi-Fi, but mobile devices are also packed with other sensors. Um, you can use microphones, you can use cameras, you can use near field barometers, magnetometers, all of these different hardware sensors in a to help infer more and more precise location. So on the next slide. Um, let's see. This is the most common way that commercial entities receive location data sets. Um, and it's the focus, I think, the most legal attention right now. So it's worth uh, un understanding in some detail. The role of the operating system on your phone, if you're using an iPhone, Apple, if you're using an Android, Google, right? The role of the operating system is to interpret all of those ambient signals that we were talking about into a latitude and longitude. Um, and then that latitude and longitude, along with usually other information, is provided through an application programming interface to app developers. So, you know, for instance, a lot of lawmakers tend to think of location data sets as coming exclusively from cell phone carriers, you know, your AT&T, your Verizon, and your other cell phone carriers. In fact, it's much more commonly available in commercial markets to get it from mobile apps through software development kits um, and through the advertisements that are served in mobile apps. Um, so this is a little walkthrough and um, we can back to this if, if, if we want, um, but it, what we're looking at basically is an app developer that sends a request to the operating system and gets back a, a latitude longitude measurement. Um, it is possible in some cases for the app developer to go around that process, you know, be, by looking out through Bluetooth access to see if there are beacons nearby, for example. Uh, but that's much less common. Um, it violates terms of service. Usually it would probably violate some, some legal regimes that we have here in the United States, but there are some technical workarounds. The most common use cases, aside from providing the service, of course, providing, you know, a ride share or alert or a geofenced alert. The most common use cases tend to have to do with advertising. So uh, you can think of serving a localized advertisement. I want to send this advertisement only to people in Washington, DC, and therefore it's, I'm willing to pay more for it. Um, but you should also think about location data and advertising in terms of audience creation, which has to do with, I'd like a list of people who go to coffee shops, people who go to the gym, or people who have been to this particular store, people who have been to my competitor's store. Um, and also think about it in terms of measurement and attribution. So increasingly what advertisers want to know 
is not uh, not just did you see the advertisement, but after you saw the advertisement, did you do something? Did you go into the store? Did you go into the competitor store? Did you do nothing? In which case that advertisement wasn't very useful. Um, there are lots of other use cases too, right? So it's obviously not just limited to advertising. We, we've got anti-fraud use cases that are out there. A lot of analytics, political targeting becomes a major legal issue. Um, and there are a lot of use cases, beneficial use cases, I think, out there with state and uh, and federal departments of transportation uh, related to urban planning. How are people moving around? How are they getting to work? How are they commuting? Where do we need to build roads and sidewalks and uh, bike lanes? So some of the issues, and, and Jake, I have a feeling we'll get into these later, so, but just to tee them up, some of the issues really involve whether people are aware of this kind of data collection. I think it's safe to say most people are not. Um, bundling of consent so when you give consent to an app are you also giving consent to that app's partners or to onward transfers um, and unexpected uses so we've seen a lot in the news lately that some of this commercial location data ends up in the hands of federal law enforcement agencies for example uh, who are buying it just the same way anyone else buys it because it's available out there on the commercial market uh, okay so I'm I'm already like going way over time, so I, I think maybe we'll we'll, uh, we'll leave some of the other slides for later, Chris, if that works for you, and I'll just go to um, the next two. Um, so again, this is just a quick overview of all of the different commercial entities that are out there. This doesn't even include government entities, right? So because our focus is on the commercial space, um, carriers are just, you know, in some sense, the tip of the iceberg. In another sense, they're, they're also regulated more heavily. So we saw a very large FCC fine uh, a couple of months ago related to location data that had been improperly shared and disclosed that originated with cell phone carriers. Um, but it's really the apps, the app partners, the data brokers, the aggregators, any other third party out there getting information from software development kits and from mobile apps that are the bulk of the commercial location data sets out there. And I'll flag uh, these entities are having to comply with generally applicable, so broadly applicable legal regimes. You've got the general data protection regulation in the EU, if it's a global company, for instance, or if they've voluntarily committed to it. You've got the California Consumer Privacy Act now in effect with regulations, and most states have unfair and deceptive practices laws. So no location specific laws uh, in the commercial space exist to my knowledge yet. And um, we can talk about whether that's a good idea, but there are at least there's some legal baselines that these companies have to comply with. Um, and then there is a world in the very bottom row here of location analytics providers that are not working through the mobile app ecosystem. So what I think a lot of end users and consumers aren't aren't aware of is that in addition to all of the data your phone is receiving and sending through mobile apps and through the operating system, just by virtue of it being a connected device, it's sending out signals out into the world, um, usually so that it can automatically connect to a network, right? So when you get home, your phone automatically connects to the home Wi-Fi. You don't have to do it manually because it's emitting signals on a regular basis. Uh, that identify it. So hardware signals, including a MAC address, uh, SSID information, and that information, I would say, for a long time in the United States, wasn't necessarily considered personally identifiable within industry. That's rapidly changing. Um, and one of the reasons is that when those hardware identifiers remain the same over time, it's pretty straightforward to count and to track how devices are moving and devices are used as a proxy for individuals. Um, so again, some of those use cases are benign. Most airports and stadiums are using this kind of ambient signal data from devices to track how many people are moving in and out of big spaces, uh, but it can get more privacy invasive when it's used to track repeat visitors or to track where devices are moving over time. Um, and None of that is subject to notice and choice because it's not happening app. There's no permission layer. It's just signals that the device is giving out. So lots of different sources of commercial location data, and maybe we'll maybe we'll wrap it there. 
that helpful? Because there, there's so much more we can get into. That's, kind of the that's great. Here. Well, you know, you, you can reserve the right to, to bring up uh, more of these if you need us to go back to slides later. Uh, no, no, I really appreciate I, that. Oh, yeah, please. Why don't we stop on the resources page for, for just a moment? Um, so I'll just flag this as our website. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on FPF. Um, and, and some of the uh, graphics I was pulling from are from a recent infographic that we published for lawmakers on helping understand the world of geolocation data. This is from a couple of months ago. Um, yeah, and, I, and, and we should get into it more. I told you we could talk about this all day. So yeah, yeah, it's no, good that we have so much time. No, that's great. Um, no, I really appreciate that. You know, you, you started, you know, talking about kind of the risks and the safeguards, but unless you actually understand how all of this tech in your pocket works, um, mm -hmm. you know, you can't understand the risks and y y you struggle with how to safeguard yourself, safeguard your family, your enterprise. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that you talked about the electronic uh, uh, emanations uh, outward, right? Because people like a I clicked on the terms of service, you know, it was my choice. And at some point, you know, once you opt into owning a cell phone at all, any form of mobile device, you're on the grid. Um, and, you know, typically, unless you're a, uh, you know, a national security professional or like a, a prepper or, you know, somebody who is really trying to prepare themselves, they don't, they don't necessarily know the extent to which they're exposed. Um, not really by choice other than the choice to, participate in modern society with a cell phone, right? So, um, no, I think that's great and a uh, great way to kick us off. So now I think we'll pass it over to Kevin, um, hand him the mic and get his perspectives on things. Uh, Kevin. Well, great. Well, Chris, thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to participate. And, and Stacy, thank you. I really enjoyed that, that perspective. I, I found it very informative. Um, and I'm learning stuff every day myself in terms of just how this technology is evolving how it's being used, what the ecosystem looks like. And, and I, I think to the point that you made earlier, I mean, it's evolving so quickly that, you know, if you had this event six months from now, you, you'd probably have a couple of other slides you'd need to provide both from a technology standpoint and a legal standpoint, right? So it, it's really interesting. And, and I agree, this is a, this is a really valuable um, panel and, and discussion. Um, from my standpoint, just to, to maybe add a little bit to what Chris said, I, I started out as a satellite imagery analyst before I went to law school. And so my background and, and interest, in, if you will, in um, location data is, is part of a larger interest around geospatial data in general, right? Not just data collected from mobile devices or some of the other technologies, but talking about drones and satellites and, and all the other ways that location data is collected. And, and, and that's important as I go through my remarks, because I, I think when we start looking at the legal perspectives on mobile location technology, it's it's important to realize that you know any as laws and policies develop around this particular use case or these this particular aspect of location, it could very well get caught up in the larger geospatial ecosystem and could have some significant impact on some of the things that people are trying to do, not just here in the United States, but around the globe to deal with not just COVID-19, but disaster response and climate change, food security, issues that are also very much tied to location and require or not require are better are better products and services can be developed if you have the granularity of the data that issues that, that this technology can do. So I'll walk through that. That's that's sort of my overarching thought. And then I have sort of three you know major points and then I'll sort of get down into the specifics. And I apologize, I don't have a I don't have a, a slides uh, on this. I'm just gonna talk uh, for a couple of minutes. But I mean my first sort of thesis, if you will, is that if the United States had a comprehensive uh, privacy, legal and policy framework that balanced the risks and benefits of location technology, if that was in place prior to COVID-19, then contact tracing would have been more easily accepted, more, more easily implemented, and you know, hopefully would have had some significant impact on the pandemic in the United States. Um, and as Chris knows, I, I've been sort of out there for a number of years trying to sort of um, talk about these issues because we're, we're seeing now the value of this technology and as Stacy pointed out, the risks associated with it too. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the technology, but I understand, you know, because of my work, that there's risks associated with it. But, but the time to do something is now so we can, you know, use the value of this technology going forward. Um, 
I also believe that the geospatial community, and, and I'm not sure what percentage of the folks here is part of this, is an ethical geo program. So I assume it's it's larger than sort of the mobile technology community or the privacy community, That, but there are a number of geospatial experts and professionals, geographers and GIS folks and everything involved. I think they know the benefits and the risks better than anyone else. Um, they, they're doing this every day. And a lot of folks that are getting involved in using location data have one or two particular use cases in mind. Some of those are good, some of those bad, but the geospatial community has been thinking about this for a number of years. I, I, I often say that you know the geospatial community was big data before big data was cool. It's been understanding and dealing with these issues, but historically it's tended to look inwards in terms of who it interacts with and how it, how you know working with solutions. And and because of that, it's not as actively engaged in some of these discussions as as I think it should be. Um, because as Stacy pointed out, the laws and policies and regulations they're they're being developed, um, and her organization and many others are participating in it. But you don't see many in the geospatial community doing that, and I think that's a challenge. Um, because for some of the reasons I'll describe, I think that location data and geospatial information in general are, are very challenging from a privacy standpoint. And then the third point, and this sort of builds on the second, is I, I see a number, I'm, I'm fortunate some of the work that I've been doing, and I see a number of presentations on how geospatial information, including mobile loca location technology, can be used to really do some important, important applications around the globe, transnational issues, national security issues, um, you know, business issues. I mean, the full gamut. And, but as a lawyer and and as in looking at this, I, I always wonder, are you going to be able to do this four or five years from now? Are you going to be able to collect that information and do the things that you want with the law changing? And, and I've said on, a, on several occasions, you know, I worry that you're going to have sort of a HIPAA type framework where it gets really hard to use because you don't, the, you got to look at the definitions, you got to look at the applications, you got to figure out which, which of the groups you fit in part of. And if that's the case, you know, a lot of these applications may not develop um, or may not, you know, reach their full potential. And I think that would be a shame. So I've mentioned before, and I'll say it, I'll say it again, you know, location privacy, I believe, is more challenging than privacy with other types of data. And I'm not saying it's more important, you know, or more sensitive. Um, we could have that discussion, but you know, healthcare data, financial data, there, there's some really sensitive types of information out there. But I think location data is more versatile. And uh, Stacy gave some examples of different things you can do with data. The example that I give is you can use location data with other types of geospatial information for a business to identify where it wants to put the store. The same information can be used by the local Department of Transportation to figure out where to build the roads to get to the store so that people can get to the store. Consumers can use that to find the store so they can buy and robbers or criminals can go there to rob the store. It's the same type of data, right? So if you try to, if you, it, it's that versatility that's that's really important. Um, also, there are just a number of different types of data that is location enabled, and, and and that includes the mobile devices. And Stacy mentioned the IoT devices and a bunch of other devices that are coming down. But you know, you can look at CCTV cameras that have um, location enabled and timestamps on them. They can be integrated into sort of products and solution and raise challenge. And we're seeing that with with Ring, for instance. Drones is something that gets a lot of attention as well. Um, that's something that has sort of come to the forefront over the past couple of years, but also satellites. People often say that satellites don't have the quality yet to do facial recognition. And that's and that's true, but there's a lat long that can be geocoded. There's a timestamp, and there's usually other information that can be used pretty not to, without too much difficulty to figure out what's going on at a location or who who who's there or who was there if you aggregate it with other data. So even satellite data is going to do that is going to be an, an issue in the future, I believe. Particularly as we move into small sats, and if we have video type quality and pervasive um, pervasive satellites, I think it's going to be a really interesting issue in the next couple of years. You start looking at key access cards. You start looking at credit card transactions. I mean, they all, all of them are location enabled and all contribute to both the solution and the issue. And, and that just goes to the point that I, I think this, this data is versatile and can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, and then we start looking at all the different um, sensors that are coming down the lights. You look at thermal IR, you look at LIDAR, you look at radar. The privacy issues around some of these technologies and thermal IR is a, is a real strong one. I mean, we're 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 going to spend a number of years trying to figure out how to how to deal with that because there are some conflicting cases out there. 
Um, there's going to be a, a trying to understand what the implications are. So again, it's 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 not the mobile location data, but it is location enabled. And it does, it is very valuable, particularly when you start using it with other types of location data. And then you start looking at AI and machine learning to do the processing. You got facial recognition technology. Again, all of those are issues in and of themselves. But when you start putting a location stamp on them or a location in a timestamp, they become increasingly more complex. And so, again, I go back to the point the geospatial community is one of many that's dealing with some of these technologies, but the aspects of location really, I think, raise the issues associated with location more so than some of the others. Don't mean to downplay the others I, and, and the importance, but the complexity I think is, is there. Uh, one of the things that I, that I find interesting, and, and, and maybe it's, it's not as big of a deal as I, as I think it is for other people, but we have been giving away our location every time we go out. And we've been doing that for years. We go out into public place, we disclose that to people. And we've gotten used to it. We, we, we go to a stadium and a, and a mall, People know we're there, right? And they know we walk out with a bag. They know we bought something there. We're fundamentally changing that by putting concern around people's location. And I don't fully understand what that means. I mean, it has some implications around cases like Carpenter, but understanding what that means and what the implications are going to be going forward and going back, I think, are going to be really important because we we never used to worry about it, and now we and now we do, and rightfully so because other people are collecting it. But how we deal with that, I think, is going to be really, really interesting and is going to have some long term implications about some of these technologies. To piggyback on that, I believe that the issues associated with more complex, because I think location privacy is less consistent across the globe and across communities. I think it depends partly on your age, your gender, your religion, whether you grew up in a big town or a small town. I grew up in a small town. Everyone knew where I was, you know, the, the teacher, the teachers knew where I was, the, everyone knew where everyone was and what they were doing because it was a small town. You didn't really have an expectation of privacy or in on anonymity. So just the expectation, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's very different than, for instance, financial information or or uh, medical records. You know, we, we sort of inherently don't want to disclose that, but now we're, we're doing others. And I think that's a challenge from a regulatory standpoint. I think location data is from a privacy standpoint, incredibly powerful. And I think it was uh, Joseph Jerome for the Center for Dem Democracy and Technology, I think it's about six months ago, he put out a tweet that said that 80% of the privacy issues could be resolved if we could get our, handle, get our, our hands around location privacy. Now I'm paraphrasing a little bit there, but, but I think his point is that you, you have privacy issues and then you put location on top of it and it gets to be a real, you have data and you put location on top of it, it gets to be a real issue. And that's because location is so powerful. You can, you can tag other pieces of data to it, medical information, demographic information, statistics, social media. All those things are make location powerful, no matter how you collect it. Now, the more, the greater granularity, the greater consistency, the greater timeliness, the better, but but you can get privacy issues without all that level of granular granularity or timeliness. And so that's the challenge with location information. Putting on top of that, um, you know, there are so many different types of platforms that are collecting it. And I ran through some of them, sensors, uh, different sensors, different platforms. Um, the user doesn't care, right? The user doesn't care where it came from. The user wants it to work. Um, but if they have to start looking at what the platform is because you've got different regulatory regimes around them, um, that's going to be a challenge, right? So if drones have certain data collection, mobile phones, the FTC has some, trying to aggregate those in ways that can be valuable, whether it be for COVID-19, whether it be for a disaster, whether it be for a business application, it's going to be a real, real challenge. And you're going to spend a whole lot of time with, with lawyers that you, that you don't want to. And I know some of these may sound trivial. Um, but as a lawyer who you know drafts privacy policies, who drafts licensing agreements, tries to think through what the implications are, try to apply them to the law that exists today and where the law is going, it's really hard. It's very, very difficult and it's only gonna get harder. Um, and again, as someone who believes this technology can be really valuable, um, I, you know, I worry about that because I do think it's gonna have some restrictions and some restrictions are good and are necessary for sure. But many of them, you know, are not. Maybe there's a neutral way to figure it out. But that's a discussion that you need to have informed technical people, operational people, and legal people and regulators in the room to discuss, right? Um, just a couple other points. Geospatial community is so large and complex. 
um, that it makes some real challenges. So I, I include government, industry, universities, individuals, people are data providers and data collectors, both the data users and data collectors, both. I mean, it, it is an ecosystem. Often simultaneously, we're both collecting data, but we're, we're giving our data away as well. And, and I don't mean that in a business way, but just we're sharing data back and forth. If you start to regulate that, you start to sort of say this group can't have it or this group we've got to be careful with. That ecosystem starts to shift a little bit because the data isn't then isn't available for others to use it. And maybe that's fine. Maybe the risk is greater. But if you don't have that discussion about, okay, who's using it and how it's being used and you just say, we're worried about this risk. It's a real, it, you run the risk of not, uh, you know, properly allocating the risk or understanding the risk and finding a solution that works best for everyone. I think some of the other challenges are, it's much harder to find in my view, location data in terms of what it is. Is it where it's collected from? Is it how timely it is? Is it a different, um, you do by how large of an area it's collected? Um, and there are, and I, you see in the in the legal community and the regulatory community, you know, just different topic or different ways that people are trying to address it. At first, it wasn't addressed at all. It'd be referenced just if you looked at the the laws. It would just say location information or geolocation information. Now people are trying to define it. CCPA 2.0 has a definition. The um, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act has a definition. Um, I think the and I, I, there's a couple other groups that are out there. I haven't had a chance to look at, but but there, it's evolving. But there's no common definition as to okay, if you collect data with this granularity, this frequency, this accuracy, then then you've got a privacy issue. Or if you collect it from this device or this type of thing, it, it's it's very much mixed. And and you know, I tell people as a lawyer, if the law is unclear, you don't understand the technology and you don't understand how it's going to be used, you're you're going to say no more often than yeah than yes. Partly that's how lawyers work, but partly that's just human nature. Putting all those together, um, I think it's it's going to be a really difficult regulatory, um, difficult to regulate this in a way that balances the the risks and the rewards um, without a, a very, very, um, very active debate, if you will, between the various constituencies and making sure that we understand what that what that is because. It is a technology that cuts across a number of different, or it is an area that cuts across a lot of different domains. It touches upon a lot of different legal areas. It's inherently international, and that raises a whole other spectrum of, of uh, legal regimes you have to worry about. And so I think it's important to sort of keep all that in mind when we, when we go forward and we start talking about these issues. And Chris, that's it, I'm done. Thank you, Kevin. Um... You know, I'm not sure if you just coined a term or if it's old hat to you, but yeah, you know, I've always heard of the expectation of privacy, but the notion that the expectation of location privacy is is different, right? Um, in different environments, because you know people know you're there. Um, uh, it's it's a very interesting uh, thing you put out there. I know, um, you know, you, you talk about we've been giving away our location data for years. I know I have. Um, but there was kind of that moment, I think my friend Jeff, jo our friend Jeff Jonas, um, he coined the term channel consolidation um, around location data where, you know, you knew, I knew I was giving my information to those guys when I went there. And I knew I was giving my information to those guys when I used that toll road or whatever. But at some point it clicked and said, oh my God, you know, it's actually really easy for kind of anybody to throw all that stuff together then that fundamentally made you kind of rethink how gracious you were handing out your 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 location data to anyone because potentially went to everyone. So um, anyways, I think you raised a ton of great issues. Uh, uh, before we go to Q&A, we'll pass it over to Jake now to hear uh, his perspective. And then I look forward to the Q&A with all of you. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, it's great to, to, to be here, and I appreciate the invitation uh, very much from, from Ethical Geo uh, to this great program. Um, and, and thanks a lot to, to Stacey uh, and to Kevin for, for their fantastic and informative uh, presentations. I, I, I learned a lot, and I think there's going to be um, a, just a ton of, of great material for further discussion. So really looking forward uh, to that. I, I would like to uh, start off, uh, maybe go to the uh, next slide. Um, by focusing on some of the risks uh, of, of location information, um, just to kind of frame the rest of my remarks and then, and then some of the rest of our discussion. Um, go to the next slide, please. 
Um, and then because we're talking about location privacy in the context of a global pandemic, I, I wanna talk about two kind of uh, COVID-19 specific issues, contact tracing and um, population-wide movement tracking. And those are areas where location data, I think, uh, could theoretically be useful. Um, but um, as, as Kevin has gestured towards, there are complexities uh, when you look at uh, the, how that, uh, that location data plays out um, in practice. And then finally, I'll talk about some legal limits on the collection and use of location information. Um, there are a lot of legal limits uh, under privacy law, uh, the FTC Act, um, but I focus primarily on our uh, case uh, at the ACLU challenging the Los Angeles Department of Transportation's collection of micromobility micro -mobility location information under the Fourth Amendment, the Constitution, and also some state statutes. So um, can you move to the next slide, please? Um, so when it comes to risks, um, I, I think there's one kind of overarching concept that I, I would love for everyone who attends this to take away. Uh, next slide, please. And that's when engineers or lawyers or potentially uh, geographers um, look at data, it's very easy to think of it as something that is abstract or that is disconnected from real people. And I think that's especially true when the identities of the people to that the data corresponds to are not apparent or easily accessible. Uh, this is a sample of location information collected from micromobility sources in Louisiana. And you'll see that there's no names or addresses uh, in, in this spreadsheet. It's very easy to look at rows of a spreadsheet and not have the potential human cost in mind. Go to the next slide. So this uh, is a picture of Fernando. He was deported to Guatemala by the Trump administration and separated from his daughter, Allison, for almost two years. And this is an image uh, when they were reunited at Los Angeles International Airport in January 2020, after that separation. And we've all seen images uh, like these, and we have uh, observed uh, the human rights abuses that are taking place in our country when it comes to members of the immigrant community. And I think we should all ask ourselves, what enables those human rights abuses to take place? And there are, of course, many answers to that question, but one of them is location information, collected often in the first instance by companies and eventually sold or produced somehow to the government. Go to the next slide, please. And this isn't hypothetical. Uh, last year, uh, the ACLU of Northern California released the results of an investigation that showed that ICE is using automated license plate reader records to find and target immigrants for deportation. Uh, next slide. And ICE is also buying location data from marketing companies, uh, and those marketing companies get their data from apps uh, that you might use to check the weather or, or find a gas station. Uh, so it's not limited to military contractors um, who, are, who are providing this information to the government. These are consumer apps that we use uh, every day. Uh, and so the first question I think we should all ask ourselves is, do we need to be using detailed, identifiable location information at all? Is there a way to achieve our goals, uh, some of which, as Kevin points out, uh, are really worthwhile um, and important, but is there a way to achieve those goals without using location information? Uh, next slide, please. So in the context of our current pandemic, you know, we've all seen the immense hardship uh, and the suffering that's caused uh, by COVID-19. And as a result, there are new goals, right? New public policy goals that really couldn't be more vital and important uh, in this time. And some of those goals uh, have been laid at the feet of technology. Um, and I'd like to start by talking about uh, contact tracing. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, uh, actually, next slide, and then um, and then the next one after that uh, with the scientific article. Great. So, to me, the possibility of digital contact tracing was most clearly laid out in this really great article from Science uh, from May of this year. And the basic idea is that when humans do contact tracing, uh, there's a delay between when a person is diagnosed and when other people who are potentially infected are notified. And that's where an app uh, or, or something like that could be helpful. And the question is whether location information from whatever source might be helpful in making contact tracing or, or as it's been more precisely called exposure notification uh, more effective. And so I just like to talk a little bit about that question. How effective is location information in enabling 
digital content for example. Go to the next slide. Actually, can we just skip to like three slides forward? Um, well, yeah, that one. <laughs> Thanks. Great. <laughs> um, so um, the the so imagine we're trying to use uh, location information to find out which of the contacts on this train or at this workplace um, are potentially infectious. This is a diagram, by the way, from from the science article that I, that I reference. And we've all heard the guidance that six feet away for 15 minutes is the threshold to be concerned about. And the ACLU released a white paper on this. And according to experts, the location information like GPS, Wi-Fi, cell site location information, uh, or even QR codes associated with uh, a particular place where people go is not sufficiently accurate in practice to accurately distinguish between infectious and non-infectious contacts between two people. GPS uh, data, uh, from what we've learned, comes closest uh, but even with a theoretical maximum of uh, one meter for sort of modern cell phones, it's more like five meters to 20 meters uh, in practice when you're talking about uh, the, the strength, the visibility to the sky, the, how old the cell phone might be, um, and, uh, and other kinds of, of interference. And so for location-based tools like all of these, um, this, uh, I think, demonstrates that location information isn't likely to be very effective at enabling contact tracing. And that's why uh, Bluetooth proximity uh, information has been the technological solution that has been offered, for example, by the Apple Google framework that we've all heard about. But even though the consensus among experts and uh, from the, the technology companies building the contact tracing frameworks is that location information isn't likely to be useful, contact tracing apps are often seeking location information from their users without a clear purpose for doing so. And I hope at this point that you share my skepticism uh, of those apps as they seek to collect people's location information. And of course, you also have the problem that no matter what information, uh, location information you use, people need to decide to install the app. Um, and in this paper, uh, it, it says that 50 percent, 70% of people need to install an app in order for it to be effective. And in my view, there's a great deal of justified mistrust of the government, but also of private industry when it comes to collecting information. And if people don't trust that their information will be private, they won't install the app, and then that stands in the way of addressing the problem. I think it's worth putting that, adding that to our list of human costs that should be named. Past failures breed mistrust. That mistrust undermines our collective ability to solve problems using technology in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So another place that we've heard location data uh, might be useful is assessing how kind of on a population level, people's movements are changing in light of social distancing guidelines and some shelter in place orders. And that information is often called anonymized, but in practice, it is anything but anonymized. Uh, next slide. So the New York Times did this really fantastic piece demonstrating how people can be identified from uh, so-called anonymized location data um, in January of this year, I think, it's called One Nation Tracked. Um, and they actually identified uh, Secret Service agents with President Trump, uh, people who attended the Women's March, and numerous other people um, in data sets that didn't have names or addresses or anything, just had identifiers for, for people. Uh, next slide, please. And this identifiable private data comes from consumer apps or even telecom companies that in many cases are just selling the information to the government. Uh, next slide. And when the government has immediate access to data that is pulled directly from apps used by hundreds of millions of people, in my view, that's a, an end run around the proper legal limits on government access to people's private information. Uh, next slide. So, um, and then, uh, and then one more. Let's talk about, um, let's talk now about some of the legal limits. Um, one more slide, sorry about that, I'm just skipping a few here. Um, let's talk about some of the legal limits uh, that exist over people's location information. And, and two laws that I, I'd like to highlight specifically are the United States Constitution, um, the Fourth Amendment, and a state statute in California called the California Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Um, that's a, a, a law that is um, stronger than the Federal Electronic Communications Privacy Act, 
And there are um, there are also similar state statutes uh, like Cal ECPA, as we call it, in New Mexico and Utah as well. Um, so uh, next slide. So depending on where you live, uh, you might recall that in 2017, uh, many communities uh, in the United States witnessed a kind of near overnight profusion of electric scooters on city sidewalks. Those scooters offered, offered a new mode of transportation uh, for smartphone equipped consumers, but they also resulted in complaints uh, from members of the public and from, uh, from city uh, governments over cluttered sidewalks, interference with right of ways, um, and other complaints as well. And in Los Angeles, uh, the Department of Transportation there created something called the Mobility Data Specification, uh, the MDS, uh, which automatically tracks the precise movement of every scooter rider uh, on the street. And in order to get permits to operate in the city, all electric scooter and bike companies had to give the LA Department of Transportation access to that information. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and even more concerning uh, is the fact that the uh, MDS is planned to be a nationwide standard governing not just micromobility like scooters and bikes, but ride shares like Uber and Lyft, and even flying in autonomous vehicles and other modes uh, of transportation as well. So in March of this year, along with uh, co-counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and Greenberg Glusker, we filed a lawsuit challenging the MDS under the Fourth Amendment and a state statute, um, cal um, and cal requires uh, that government gets a warrant before they access um, location information or other information about people held by service providers. And given the importance of location uh, information to privacy, as articulated in cases like Carpenter and also uh, in, in cal itself, um, this is a case that I think really shows how, um, how government access to information uh, is is problematic and doesn't uh, isn't fully taking into account the legal limits that do exist. Um, and in addition, the purchase uh, in addition to the purchase of, of location information, using permit processes like LADOT is doing here uh, also represents an end run around legal limits. But in this case, uh, they don't, in my view, uh, pass muster. So the solution here, in my view. Uh, is for government entities, uh, and I think this applies to the private sector as well, to specify in advance the policy goals that need to be achieved before collecting intensely private data about people. And the approach we've seen uh, here with respect to the LA Department of Transportation and in other cities as well, is to collect all of the information in a detailed identifiable form and then figure out what to use it for after the fact. Um, I would offer that that model has a pretty poor history when it comes uh, to the private sector, and it's not going to work out well for the government uh, either. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, and uh, thanks very much. And yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jake. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I appreciate this kind of swirl of issues where the government, different parts of the government are trying to do different things. And their hearts may be in the right place, but they're kind of stomping on each other in ways that they probably didn't anticipate until like an ACLU lawsuit comes up at them. And, oh, oh okay, what do I do about that? Um, but I was taken by your comment that, you know, like in, in the world of COVID-19, right, Wi-Fi and GPS may be insufficient to actually determine contact, right? So if, if that's the specific reason the app is being put out and yet it's determined you know, that, uh, that, that goal can't be met, um, uh, then why are you doing it? And I think, you know, it came up in one of our international panels that the country of Norway has just decided like its efficacy met with the downside of the data breaches is sufficiently bad that they just scrapped the whole thing. Now, that's a small country, Norway, it's kind of like probably the small town Kevin grew up in. Uh, there, you know, there's other ways to go about it. You may not need location tracking there. Um, but it, it kind of makes me, makes me realize, you know, well, this is a complex, uh, set of issues. So, um, thank you for that. And I think I'll just, um, roll into some questions. I do want to encourage all of you, um, to feel free to not answer the questions and answer a question of your own, uh, um, <laughs> uh, imagination, because I think you guys have a lot of, um, um, 
useful worldviews that that uh, uh, would inform the questions we should be asking. So I'll start with these questions, but feel free to deviate a bit from the program. Um, so different nations are grappling with location privacy issues in their various COVID-19 contact tracing implementations in different ways. As American lawyers, uh, or I'll say it this way, as American lawyers, um, uh, can you give us any simple models for how to think about um, how and why these other countries uh, are using and thinking about location privacy? Uh, I mean, do you have any experience that you go, well, of course it's going to work in that country because they think about it this way and we don't think about it that way. Or, um, you know, of course it'll work in that country that uh, it functions like a small town that Kevin grew up in. Um, you know, can, can you, does anybody want to take a bite at maybe, maybe you're not international experts on this stuff, but just things you've seen out there in, uh, 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 out in the world. Um, Stacy, you have a furrowed brow, but I think that's because you have uh, you have uh, an experience you want to relay. Well, yeah, I, I don't know that I'll be much of an internet expert on this specific question you're Canada, asking, but on, I mean, with Canada. <laughs> so there. There are a couple of different ways to think about this. There are countries that are adopting location based models and, and countries that are adopting proximity based models. There are also countries that are adopting centralized models versus decentralized models. Um, and those two things don't always line up, right? Um, so on, on a couple of the points that Jake made, so first, whether or not location data has the effectiveness to properly do either contact tracing or exposure notification. Um, I'm not sure that it's as ineffective as some of the earlier reports that we saw around cell site location data. So, for instance, location data from cell towers, the kind of location data that your cell phone carrier holds already and that governments started early on requesting access to, that kind of data is certainly not precise enough within the six foot level that you need for contact tracing and exposure notification. Um, but app based location data, if it's um, if it's a phone that's requesting precise location data and that person has Bluetooth and Wi Fi on, which most phones do, right? Uh, that data does tend to be very, very precise. The only thing that it might not give you is, you know, if you have two people within the same latitude, longitude, but there's a wall between them, you know, maybe that's not an exposure risk. But other than that, I think you can get in the sort of six feet parameter. That's not to say that a lot of the commercial data sets that are out there are any good necessarily as they stand, because there is a lot of there's a lot of market incentive, particularly in the advertising space, to use inaccurate data because it, it doesn't really matter as much for, for marketing use cases, for example, that the data be really accurate and really precise. So you see a lot of you know uh, market puffery around companies that are like, yeah, it's super accurate and precise. I mean, maybe the data really isn't. But designing an app from scratch, designing it in collaboration with, with private experts, um, can provide really precise and accurate location data. So I, I just I just don't want to discount it right away. I still don't think it's the right thing to necessarily be using uh, because you're you have this immediate trade off of trust. People don't want to share their location data, right? And if you can do it through other means, such as decentralized Bluetooth based exposure notification, uh, then you're going to get a much higher adoption rate. Uh, I think some of the studies around whether you need 70% or 60% adoption rate in order for an app to be effective have been debunked a little bit. It's more like there is an increasing amount of effectiveness the more adoption that you have. So at low levels of adoption, you're going to have low levels of effectiveness, but maybe a little bit, right? And so and then the more adoption, the more effective it's going to be. Um, so collecting location data might work. It might work for things other than exposure notification like identifying hotspots. Um, and so a lot of public health authorities are interested in this for all of those other reasons, right? Um, and then the, the counter is you'll have much higher adoption rates for exposure notification apps that are based on Bluetooth 
the downside being the public health authority doesn't have information, it's not centralized, but the upside being maybe you save more lives because more people are adopting it and downloading it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I agree with almost everything that uh, Jake and Kevin have been talking about. I think it's inevitable for those who are sort of in the audience thinking about this from a technical perspective. The law is coming. It's inevitable that location data in my mind is going to be regulated even more so than it's already regulated. Um, there's regulation by law. Jake pointed a lot of these out. There's regulation by code too. Um, so operating system regulating location data more and more through things like MAC address randomization, changes to the advertising identifiers that developers can access, changes to the permissions, making them more and more and more granular, right? Um, so regulation by law, regulation by code, regulation by social norms. And the challenge I think for lawyers is as we see more and more political momentum towards greater consumer regulation in this space, the challenge for lawyers is gonna be how do you do it right? So how do you how do you write the definitions correctly? How do you write a location privacy law in a way that isn't under inclusive or over inclusive? Um, and and that's it, that's what we're focusing on. It says, yeah, yeah. It, 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 but um, it doesn't need to be updated six months or a year from now, right? Because of different exactly. different applications. Right, so I think the, I think the GDPR is a good model. I'm not sure that it's being uh, enforced as, as much as some advocates would like or how would envision it being enforced. But I think the, the GDPR legal regime is a good model because it doesn't actually have any restriction for location data. Uh, the same as the GDPR doesn't have any restrictions around facial recognition, but those things are both heavily regulated because they fall under the category of personal information and it falls into the category of tracking people's private lives. So um, similarly, I'm, you know, I'm not sure we need a location privacy law in the United States. What we need is a baseline consumer comprehensive law that establishes protections for personal information, whether it's collected through your MAC address or through an app developer or through facial recognition or wh whatever the method is of tracking people in their personal lives uh, and using that information for unexpected purposes. That should be regulated and that's yeah, exactly. Kevin, that's how you keep it from having to be updated every 6 months, even though. Updates probably will be needed over time through things like rulemaking. Yeah. Chris, anyway, just some stuff yeah. off the cuff. Yeah, great. Thanks for starting us off. Stacy Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, so so I have, um, I, I, I have talked on this issue to in a number of international settings and I think a couple things that 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 impact this issue is one, as I talked about in my remarks, I mean, pe different countries, different cultures have a different sense of location privacy than others, right? So in, in some it's a much higher concern and some it's it's much lower and some are concerned that they don't want the government to have it and some are concerned they don't want industry to have it, right? So there's this cultural aspect to it. And then to Stacy's point, there are parts of the world and, and Europe being one, that have an overarching privacy law that at least, um, you know, at a, at a very general level covers some of this. So you can, I mean, one, you've got a whole bunch of people who are educated in this and, and are thinking about this, both lawyers, operational, technical folks, but also people who are, um, you know, you've got an enforcement mechanism if someone goes too far. And, it, you know, it's not perfect, clearly, but there is, there is that that's there and, and we don't, you know, the United States doesn't have that and it has a lot of different, it has a sense of, um, as we're finding out, a sense of, you know, individualism that, that adds to the complexity. So I, I do think we have some unique challenges here, which is, you know, why we are where we are, right? For good or for bad, right? So. Yeah. Jay, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Good, Jay. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah I, uh, it's such a such an interesting issue, um, and and I, I think that the the I'd like to pick up on one theme in, in in both Stacey and Kevin's remarks, which is this notion that um, there's cultural differences with respect to location privacy. Um, and you know, I think you know we, we talk about this in 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 terms of comparing uh, you know United the United States with with um, uh, other countries or, or or other continents, but you know the United States is not uh, a monolith, and there are going to be uh, deep cultural differences in the United States. 
Um, and, you know, with respect specifically to something like contact tracing, I think for some of the reasons that I, I laid out with respect to the risks to immigrant communities um, or the experience uh, that black people have with police violence and over policing in their communities, um, those are going to give rise to different levels of willingness to share information uh, from those communities. And, and I think with, with very good reason. Um, and that has implications both for the sort of efficacy of contact tracing as a general matter, but also for the equity of contact tracing. Um, if white people in the United States, uh, on this panel, we're all, uh, it appears, white people, um, we don't uh, necessarily have the experience of, um, of being concerned about uh, our communities, uh, our families, ourselves, our bodies being harmed as a result of information about us being held by law enforcement. Um, and that, I think, means that something like contact tracing could benefit uh, white people or people without that history of over-policing, uh, but would not black benefit uh, uh, black and, and brown communities. And that's something that I think needs to be uh, a really, you know, just sort of uh, explicit part of the, of the conversation. Um, and, um, uh, and, 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 and I think that kind of leads into the notion uh, that uh, that that has to be um, taken taken into consideration with respect to manual contact tracing as well. We're just talking um, about about people. Um, one one detail about this um, from a recent um, discussion that, that um, has had been had in the California legislature. Um, California legislature uh, recently considered uh, a few um, contact tracing specific privacy bills, uh, and one of the provisions uh, that at the beginning was in those privacy bills, they said that. Contact tracing information collect, that was collected uh, could not be used uh, by law enforcement. And uh, the reason for that, I, I think, was that some people might think that if law enforcement had access to information about them, uh, they could be targeted by law enforcement, uh, their communities could be subject to further policing, um, and uh, that would put them in danger. And so they wouldn't consent to the contact tracing. And the fact is that uh, government interests, law enforcement interests, pushed back on that. Um, and I, I think that, to me, that is an indication uh, that we do have a kind of deep substantive difference of opinion with respect to whether or not uh, certain kinds of things that are should inure to the public benefit also can be used uh, by the government uh, to harm people. Um, and uh, I think that's a difficult conversation to have, but uh, a vital one. No, I think that's a great point. I mean, the cultural references all of you are mentioning um, we, we have, as we've been putting together these panels, we've um, had a lot of interaction with international colleagues and, you know, like talk with our friends in Taiwan and, you know, they they framed all of this COVID-19 as another natural disaster, the same way a tsunami or a typhoon or anything else is a natural disaster. And there was a kind of cultural comfort with the government knowing where everybody was because it's the government that's going to send the alert that says, tsunamis coming run from the beach. Um, and in, in the same case, they were sending out alerts saying there's too many people in this public park. You couldn't possibly be, you know, socially distanced enough. But, you know, there's there aren't the same social divisions, or at least they don't appear to be this. I'm sure there are that I'm unaware of, but they don't appear to be, appear to be the same social divisions as if they went into a black neighborhood and started slicing the data and handing it out to law enforcement around enforcement. So I appreciate uh, those those comments for sure. Um, did anybody else want to chime in on this topic before I move back into uh, some other questions? I see two hot mics. No? Okay. So um, thank you for that. That was a great discussion. <clears throat> um, to talk a little more on the international side, I guess I call it more transnational. So now with all of the COVID-19 related travel bans that we as Americans are subject to, but as so are many others, um, it's hard imagining the world reopening to international travel without some sort of, uh, I think the term is health passporting. Um, given the international travel between different sovereign nations is more of a privilege than a right. I mean, I guess a citizen has a right to go home maybe, but the rest of us don't have a right to enter somebody else's country. Um, all of us will have to disclose much more about our previous travel and health status. What location privacy issues will this force us to deal with? And I'm sure all of you have thought about, you know, this mobile location tech when I just moved from America to Canada on a regular day, right? I'm changing jurisdictions, there's changing issues. Um, maybe how should we think about this as we clearly are going to wade into some kind of health passporting? 
uh, Kevin, it, uh, your mic's hot. I don't know if that means you're volunteering. Uh, no, I just it's it's easier for me to have it on, and because I've been having some trouble with my with okay. my mouse, but that's fine. I, I I um, it seems to me there's a there's as in a lot of these things, there's a lot of layers to it, right? Um, and you know, I I worry about if you start making it acceptable to not let someone come in because they were potentially exposed to a COVID-19 issue, then do you not let them in because they were potentially went in an area where there was polio or where there was something else, right? And 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 but that's a higher level policy issue and and but we do do it for foot and mouth, right? Have you visited a farm? No, no, but but yeah, I mean there there, there are things and and, and it, but so it's it's a complex issue and 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 a lot of it has, doesn't have to do with location. I I, I do think um and I think this is going on now, and 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 probably Jake knows better than I. But you know, I, I wonder if you stop it, if you have to turn your phone in as you enter the United States, and they have the ability to find out where where you've been, been with, where you've traveled, why have you gone there, who did you meet with, you were there. I mean, that's that's going on now, right? And, and there's a um, and having you know traveled since and been to places that, that you know probably I've been worried that they're gonna they're gonna do that and. You know, in some ways, you sort of prepare for that, right? In terms of what device you take or right. you know what you disclose. But I, I do think that's that's going to be part of of where we where we move to, right? I mean, people are going to where have you been, who you've been with. Um, there's going to be a database. It's going to be able to tell what activities were taken on there, and and you know, hopefully, it's a privilege for sure. But it's it's certainly one that a lot of people have taken advantage of over the past you know ten years or so. And I, I would argue that it's made the world a better place, not a worse place. And I, and I would hate to see, again, because of the trade-off between benefits and risk, you know, certain segments saying the risk is too great, we can't let him or her in because they went to someplace A, particularly, and you mentioned this earlier, you know, the data quality issues, um, you know, the, the, the ability of the, you know, if we look, we're using artificial intelligence and machine learning to make those decisions, I mean, it's a, it's a there's a lot of potential issues, um, which you know everyone on this this call probably is aware of. But I I do see at least some countries implementing that. Some are doing it within their own countries, right? Right. Uh, passports, but they're doing it in their own country. So I I do think it's something we'll need to worry about in the future. Great, Jake. I see your mic. Yeah. So uh, Kevin, it's such a um, it's it's a it's a it's a great uh, issue to to spot um, and. I can talk a little bit about device search uh, at the border, and I think it'll be really interesting to see how this um, this issue of device searches at the border plays out uh, when the potential risk of people coming in uh, from other countries where there's elevated uh, coronavirus cases. Although, you know, right now, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> almost anywhere they come from is going to be better than here. So, uh, so there's that. Um, but um, so, uh, and I, I'm summarizing this law based on memory. So, so you know, no promises that I'm correct, but. Uh, so this is when, when uh, somebody comes into the United States, there is a, um, an ability for the government to um, to search uh, their belongings, and that includes uh, the devices to some extent. Um, there's a distinction in the law between uh, what they call a forensic search or what they call um, or, or a non-forensic search, and that's just whether uh, something is plugged into the device and information is extracted off it. That would, that would constitute a, a forensic search. Um, and in the Ninth Circuit right now, you actually need reasonable suspicion, to my recollection, uh, it's a case called Cano, C-A-N-O, um, to do a forensic search. Um, and I think that's what you would need in order to rigorously assess whether or not uh, somebody has been, um, you know, in, in a place where there's heightened uh, coronavirus risk. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that, so that reasonable suspicion um, is the thing that I think is going to be uh, questioned when it comes to assessing whether or not this kind of uh, of search is is permissible uh, under the law um, uh, when it comes to looking at uh, people coming in, coming into the country and thinking about coronavirus uh, as a potential risk. But I think that's a uh, it's a it's a fascinating uh, area and it's going to be an interesting uh, uh, thing to watch uh, as the law develops. Yeah, great. Stacy, did you want to chime in on this one at all? Yeah, it's a tricky set of issues, right? I think the jury is still out on immunity passports. Just with the science is not there yet on whether we can actually establish that kind of thing. I think there are issues with scale. It takes a long time to roll out sorts of these sorts of things. And by the time that there was an effective system in place, the whole question might be moot. Um, 
the thing that would be, I think, arguably easier is what's what Jake's describing. So travel restrictions based on detailed location history. And um, I haven't seen that at a technological sort of a technical level of searching a phone to, to determine the location history. And I think it would raise a lot of it would raise a lot of concerns, right? So it's uh, it's challenging to distinguish between that use case and a use case uh, involving checking anyone who comes in at a border for um, suspicious looking location histories, right? Uh, so the question is always about balance. Can, it, can you achieve the same goals through less invasive means? And if so, that's certainly gonna be the right answer. Great. Jake, did you wanna chime back in? Just, I wanted to make one point about immunity passports. Uh, completely agree with Stacy uh, that there's just the, the, the sort of like technical issues to whether it's it's possible to do that. Uh, but I think there's also the uh, the question of incentives. I mean, um, you know, we don't want people to be taking the risk at infecting themselves in order to get a job or to be able to travel. Um, and you know, the 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 the, um, the epidemiological and also the um, disease characteristics of COVID nineteen, I think, are uh, are kind of really, really problematic uh, or, or complicate this and make it very difficult. Because, you know, a lot of people are asymptomatic uh, when they when they uh, get COVID-19. Um, uh, obviously, like older older people are, are more at risk. Um, and so we really wouldn't want to put a, play, a regime in place, uh, either a practical uh, regime or a legal regime that uh, encourages people, maybe younger people, uh, to infect themselves, uh, recover, and then be able to get an immunity passport so that they can get a job, um, you know, in the in the in the midst of an economic economic crisis. Um, and you know, of course, like those incentives are going to be most uh, felt most acutely uh, by people who are, uh, have lost their jobs or who are economically struggling. Um, and so, um, you know, we've already seen vulnerable communities already um, experiencing the harm of COVID nineteen disproportionately. And I uh, have serious concerns that an immunity passport would uh, make that worse. Great. Um, so I've got another question. It's it's international, transnational in nature. I'm always struck, you know, when I land in another country, open up my phone, I get that text that tells me, you know, what my data rates are going to cost and things like that, um, which I assume, I don't know if that's just my carrier or if, if, if it's a legal thing, but, you know, we don't have a similar thing for location tax or you know uh, kind of location privacy policy given the transnational nature of location tech and data and the na national and even subnational nature of location privacy law how do you think of the responsibility of public sector jurisdictions and even private sector service providers uh to informing uh users uh consumers citizens uh, of their rights and the risks as they move around the world. Like, should I get the text when I land that says, here's the summary of our location law, by the way, you know, um, here's the agency that tracks you or, you know, it's illegal for anyone to track you, by the way, you know, I, you know, sh how should that work or how might that work in the future? Ah, Kevin, there you go. It's like a game show. Who hit the buzzer first? Go ahead, Kevin. So, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer a, a little bit different, I think. Although I think it's it's in the same realm. Okay. Um, I think it's really hard because of the nature of location information to come up with a one size fit all privacy policy, privacy statement. Um, legal, legal, you know, summary of something in any way, because it cuts across so many domains and so many technologies and so many, you know, regulatory sectors that, um, you know, even trying to do that, um, would, it would lose its effectiveness, um, unless you basically said, you know, you're, it's the wild, wild west here. Everyone's collecting your location. Good luck. I mean, unless it's something that simple. Or you know I, something like that. I, I I just think it's it's really hard, and that goes back to the discussion I had about you know why this is so different, because because of that, right? And so that that's my only point. Does anybody else want to pick up on that? I mean, I agree it's complicated. That's kind of why I put the question out there. Jake. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think um, 
it, it, it would be remiss not to talk a little bit about the Shrens 2 decision in response to uh, this, this, this question. Um, so, um, so uh, just recently, the, um, the uh, high, EU's highest court issued a decision uh, invalidating uh, something, a data transfer agreement between the European Union and the United States uh, known as the Privacy Shield. Um, and the Privacy Shield, just generally speaking, allowed uh, companies to transfer data um, and not uh, be out of compliance uh, with, uh, with, with the GDPR. Uh, but in this, in this case, known as Trends 2, the EU Court of Justice said that because of national surveillance uh, law in the United States and because of the ability for um, the government in the United States to access communications that enter the United States, um, that privacy shield was was invalid. And so, you know, there's a lot of concern uh, that the fact that the, um, the federal government in the United States has access to the private communications and even just the data flows uh, that are happening within uh, companies uh, in the cloud, for example, uh, could be put uh, in uh, in question uh, by by the, the GDPR because it doesn't um, so they can't take advantage of the privacy shield anymore. And so, um, Chris, your question was about what the sort of public sector responsibility is, and you know, there I think that um, there is a uh, I think there's a difficult discussion to be had between. Uh, the private sector uh, uh, companies and also the government about um, how uh, United States uh, government access to private information is actually uh, really standing in the way of uh, effective um, and efficient transfers of data by businesses. Um, and um, you know, this 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 to, to me is sort of the chickens coming home to roost uh, uh, by the surveillance state. Um, but I think that's something that, that should be a part of the conversation as well. Yeah, great. Well, you, you anticipated my next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Stacy, did you want to chime in at all? No, it's a really good point. I think it, it highlights the main challenge which, with having that kind of sector notification, um, even if you wanted one, because it's really, it's, it's sometimes it's less about the geographic location that you're in and more about the, who's holding the data, who's getting the data, which is usually across state and international lines, right? Yeah. Could be physically located in the United States using an app that's collecting location data and sending it to another country or another state. Um, right. An app from a European and, country that's reselling the data to an American government, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Jake, Chris, can I make ask Jake a question? Yeah, please do. Um, about SHREMS 2, um, is the, I mean, arguably, there are European countries that have significant access to personal information as well, or can get personal information as well, but they are subject to GDPR. So, the, the, the it's not, you know, the, the, you don't have to worry about external transfers, right? So, is the is the issue as much that we don't that about? You know the, the U.S. government's access, or that we don't have a federal privacy policy in place that would deal with some of these issues. Well, so uh, I mean, in, in reading the, the European Court of Justice's decision, I mean, I I thought that the the, the main focus of that analysis was um, was U.S. government access to uh, to information held in the United States. Um, I, I I think it's possible that that um, a federal privacy law might do something to ameliorate those those concerns, but um, but I I don't see how you can not um, how you can uh, get to a different result if you look at the the Schrems two decision without having you know reform um, of of some of the surveillance laws that that animated the concerns of, of the European Court of Justice. Um, I, I say that um, uh, being a, an interloper <laughs> in transnational data flows and the GDPR, so um, uh, they're deferred to others' expertise there. But in reading the decision, it does seem like the surveillance law um, was the, the main animating concern and that you can't get around it without uh, reform there. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in on that? So, okay, so I'm going to, this has come up at least twice, but I want to ask it in a pointed way and and see see if it changes the answers or if it gets us to a solution so for a long time privacy discussions have been about a citizen's rights vis-a-vis -vis the state more recently a lot of new privacy laws have focused on consumer rights vis-a-vis -vis companies and their use of your data 
with governments increasingly purchasing and consuming mobile location telemetry data uh, collected by co commercial platforms, we now face a complicated collision between these two worlds. How do you see this shaking out over the next what arbitrary time horizon? <laughs> I'm going to give it to Jake. <laughs> Okay. It was, it was a close one. It was a, it was a close one. Uh, so, um, uh, I mean, I, th I think the short answer is, is, is not well, uh, it's it, it, it quite poorly indeed. Um, but, um, to, to, to give a, a, a kind of like, um, a, a hint of what I think is, is, uh, a regulatory framework that I, I think would, would make sense. Um, I'd like to highlight some of the work that, uh, that, um, the ACLU of Northern California has done and also the ACLU of Massachusetts has done. Uh, surrounding facial recognition. Uh, so I think it's a huge concern uh, that governments are now buying information from uh, 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 from the private sector and using that information as essentially a replacement for what would have required for the process in the past. Um, and uh, and I think it's a it's a it's a difficult issue. And uh, that acquisition um, has, in all in all candor, fairly few uh, limits um, in terms of uh, actual legal prohibitions. Um, the sort of good news is that in many cases, um, you know, the federal government and also state governments have sunshine laws that actually give people access to the fact that that information, that those contracts exist and that information is being collected and something about um, what information is actually being searched. And that's how we uh, uh, got access to the fact that, um, that ICE was purchasing uh, automated license plate reader data and using it to, to find immigrants um, and deport them. So sunshine laws are a big part of the response. Um, but so for facial recognition, um, you know, uh, our, our team has uh, worked on uh, bans of facial recognition used by government in, um, in, in San Francisco, but Oakland and Berkeley, uh, and then ACLU of Massachusetts has done it in, in, in Boston and Cambridge uh, and Brookline. Um, and those bans, generally speaking, include a prohibition on acquisition of services um, or acquisition of data from private entities that are doing the free facial recognition themselves. Um, and so I think that's a that's a that's something that needs to be thought about in uh, privacy laws, um, whether it's privacy laws uh, for government conduct or for or for private industry, um, is thinking about really problematic and harmful acquisitions for data, and then putting in place uh, prohibitions where it's appropriate. Great. Does anybody else want to pick up on that? So it's 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 a couple of different things that I think Jake raised, right? One is governments purchasing location data and other types of data as an end on getting a warrant based on probable cause approved by a judge, right? That seems to clearly be a violation. I think there's a lot of consensus. We could we could introduce a law that I think would get a lot of support and possibly there will be one coming up in the next few months um, that would cut off that kind of law enforcement access. Um, but local governments in particular, and you see this with a lot of the smart city efforts, are interested in acquiring data for other purposes. Um, they have, I think, a, a healthy skepticism of tech companies who want to run these things for them, and they typically have limited budgets, right? Um, but they're interested in using data for the same reasons, for the same sort of good beneficial reasons that as anyone else, as any of the, the smart city tech companies, which involve things like improving urban planning, improving transportation. Um, the problem, I think, is they typically don't have the data governance laws, norms, established standards, resources um, as private companies. So they want to get into the data game, so to speak, but don't have the right data governance restrictions. Um, and so that data ends up getting collected for one purpose and then potentially reused or sort of sent across the hallway to a law enforcement agency. Um, and then there's law enforcement agencies or other agencies, departments of transportation, for instance, that are interested in purchasing data rather than collecting it directly like DOT, but just purchasing the data for their own sorts of analysis. And when the data is out there and commercially available in commercial markets uh, widely, they, I think, understandably think that it's a strange outcome for it to be 
widely commercially available, but not available for a government actor to purchase for non law and law enforcement, non immigration, right? Um, non enforcement purposes. So, yeah, we're absolutely seeing this like direct collision of public and private concerns and public and private legal regimes. That's going to be really challenging to sort out. Right? So we've been supportive of a fine consumer privacy law for a long time. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that the 1974 privacy act originally applied to private sector and public sector and then got limited and now only applies to the public sector. Um, other regimes don't do that. So the GDPR, for instance, applies to both public and private entities. And we can take a approach in the United States, but we have such a complicated sectoral regime already in place that just the, the political momentum is challenging. But that that's probably ultimately where it needs to turn out. Uh, that's fascinating. I did not know that that was um, that's how it started in 1970 and that it bifurcated from there. That's interesting. Um, you know, we've had a couple the GDPR. Oh. I, I mean, yeah. Before, I mean, you can make a really solid argument that the GDPR is based on the 1974 Privacy Act, certainly based on the FIPS, right? So, um, even though we're sort of looking to the EU as being this gold standard right now, all of the fair information privacy practices are rooted in the United States. Is the United States' origin to both privacy and data protection, and we're kind of, in a lot of ways, 40 years, 50 years later, coming back to our roots. Right, they've been eroded as it relates to private sector data collection. Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, we've um, had some other folks on previous panels. Uh, uh, we had Gene Holm from uh, LA, uh, their chief data officer, but also Kate Garman from CityFi. And, you mm -hmm. know, Kate talked quite a bit about the um, surveillance or, I don't know what you call them, not, not really anti-surveillance acts um, that she helped uh, put in place in, I want to say, Seattle and also some work maybe in Kansas City, um, where, you know, they, they, they're, they're looking at, you know, which individual pieces of technology and data will we allow and for what purposes, and a new one isn't allowed to be deployed until it's gone <laughs> through an entire process where they look at social impact and whatever, and, you know, it, it may be an onerous process, but yeah. it's a deliberate process with kind of clear, open, you know, use. And as somebody that's deployed a lot of um, technology into, you know, federal, state, local environments, it doesn't actually happen as fast as you think it does anyway. So that process may not actually slow anything down. But, um, uh, you know, I, I'm interested a little bit in those surveillance laws at the city level. Um, because it, you know, Jake, you brought up facial recognition, and that's happening at the city level. But there, uh, I think Kevin's brought up all this Internet of Things. I know Stacy's worked all this smart city tech. Um, you know, we talk a lot about federal regulation, but what role does state and local putting together in our jurisdiction? Here's what's allowable, what's not allowable. Here's what is disclosed. Here's what's knowable. Every citizen can know what you know what we're doing, et cetera, in terms of you know, what might broadly be rolled into surveillance um, because that impacts COVID-19, right? We're rolling things out for COVID-19 surveillance, but then when COVID-19 is done, do we just leave that there? Do we sunset it? How should we think about this stuff at a state and local level, given some of the precedents that have been set with surveillance laws? Jake, you open your mouth. Yeah, yeah that's right. So uh, <laughs> thanks for noticing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so so I, I think the, the state level um, and and local level uh, surveillance laws like this are are really critical. Um, in uh, the, the facial recognition bans that have been that have been put in place in San Francisco uh, and, and Oakland and Berkeley are actually um, either either include or are on on top of existing uh, surveillance rules uh, like the ones that that you've described in Seattle and, and, and Kansas City. And just generally speaking, those um, those laws um, and it's 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 an effort called community control over police surveillance. Um, and uh, the ACLU has a page about it. We have a model um, a model uh, city ordinance um, and a whole bunch of information about uh, all the different uh, places where ordinances like that have been passed. Um, the basic idea is to bring some uh, democratic accountability to the acquisition of surveillance technology. Um, and so, you know, to be, to be super clear, like. If a city wants to buy a drone and, uh, you know, take um, a whole bunch of pictures of uh, really like granular pictures of people's movements um, under these surveillance ordinances, they could do that. Um, they just have to have um, a proposal. They have to have a use policy. Uh, they have to have, you know, a city council meeting or something along those lines where they give people the opportunity to comment. Uh, and then they have to have 
uh, trainings, and then they have to have uh, you know annual um, assessments to determine whether or not the rules are being followed, um, and to have kind of ongoing um, accountability to the community with respect to the use of that technology. Um, and I think that's that's kind of a um, a a model that I think is effective for the kind of surveillance technology that maybe isn't um, as uh, as problematic as something like facial recognition. And so, I, you know, I think that there's a um, uh, there's a, a pragmatic distinction being drawn uh, in, for example, places like San Francisco, looking at um, surveillance technology as a general category and saying like you can cities can buy it, but there needs to be democratic accountability and oversight uh, and transparency. And then facial recognition, which um, is such a kind of problematic, dangerous, toxic technology that the city can't uh, purchase it at all. Um, and sort of saying, for some things, there should be a ban. Uh, for most things, uh, there should be democratic accountability and transparency. Uh, Stacy, you have some experience in this. Uh, what are your What are your thoughts? The question is around the role that, that local cities and local city regulations play. Right. Yeah, I mean, a huge role, right? Because nothing's happening at the federal. Or, uh, <laughs> ideally, we need a federal baseline for for at least the commercial side uh, of this. Um, and I think there's a good argument that that necessarily has to preempt some of the city level uh, ordinances and some of the state level laws but not all are clearly some issues that are inherently local in my mind. Um, but if you end up with different private sector regulation in different places as you go state to state and city to city, uh, if you're a company that operates in all of those places, you end up not being able to build uh, an internal compliance regime right, to be able to comply with all of those laws. Bans are a little bit different, right? Because um, a moratorium or a total ban on the use of a technology in a particular geographic area is pretty straightforward, right? Just, just don't do that thing. Where it becomes challenging is when you have different regulations around things like whether people need to consent or whether it's okay for them to just be able to opt out or what kind of access to information do you have to provide to the residents of this city versus the residents of that city versus the residents of this state. Um, we're just sort of at the very beginning of that. There really isn't very much regulation out there. You can kind of count it on maybe one, two hands. Um, but as things progress over the next five years, it'll be really important to have at least a baseline of a uniform set of both rights and obligations for companies. Chris, I, can I uh, just throw in a couple of points? Please. So I, I worry understanding the risks. I, I worry that the I, I worry that a, a a balkanized legal regulatory framework on these technologies by city, by state, um, is is going to make their uh, the ability to do some of the things you know that the geospatial community broad, more broadly wants to wants to do or even within within communities. I mean, a lot of larger issues involve data from, you know, across a state or across all urban communities or across, um, you know, different communities. And 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 yeah, it requires data and and, and increasingly requires requires data with more granularity. And if if you've got these to, to Stacy's point, uh, if you've got a ban, then you don't have it. If you've got to try to figure out consent and notification requirements to go through public policy, you know, public um, forums on these things, I think it gets it gets really difficult. And I'm not saying that there aren't risks associated with them. There are risks associated with all of them, but it it seems to me it's harder at the local level, in particular, to have a meaningful discussion around the the risks and rewards. At a, at a federal international level. And, and that's partly because of just the way local politics works. It's also partly because just what their their particular interest is. Um, so I, I just I just throw that out there. I, I, I mean, I think both Stacy and, and Jake are right. I mean, that's, that's the way we're going um, because we don't have, you know, whether it be dysfunction in, in, uh, in Washington or whether it just be, we're not 
adult enough, enough, adult enough yet to have this discussion, but that's where we're going. And I and I worry if it isn't fixed sooner rather than later, what the what that's going to mean for a lot of types of geolocation, geospatial information. <laughs> great. Yeah. Just, just a, yeah. I, uh -oh. oh, you're fighting for the mic. This is great. I'm going to go to Stacy. Go ahead, Stacy. Uh, I agree with that. I'll just add the the added wrinkle that a, a lot of um, private sectors that are dealing with location data sets are, for purposes of their own risk minimization, keeping it as anonymous as possible. Um, it's clear that 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 data is not anonymous in most cases. I mean, Jake, you've made a really compelling point. I think the evidence is clear on this, right? Um, once you have a persistent identifier following someone around, you can re-identify them fairly easily given enough time and precision. Um, but companies, um, most of the commercial location intelligence firms are not tying it to name, they're not tying it to any other ID, they're doing their best to try to keep it good and as anonymized as they can. Um, so the challenge that that creates for different privacy regimes with different access and choice requirements is that sometimes in order to comply with those, you end up making people re-identify their own data when they otherwise wouldn't. Um, so if you, for instance, have a practice of redacting dwell time overnight, which shows you where a person lives, or you redact sensitive locations like schools and churches and things like that, um, and then you are faced with a local law that says this data is personal information. Um, how do you respond to that? How do you know whether the data you hold is a resident of the state, somebody passing through, um, or in some way triggers your legal obligations without taking additional steps to figure that out? So it's, it's, it's challenging. All right, Jake, you wanted to chime in. Yeah, I, th I think there's a really interesting discussion to be had about um, kind of what the right level of um, like sort of as a policy matter where we want policy innovation to happen um, and how that balances against, uh, you know, so putting in pretty protections in place that protect people today versus versus waiting. Um, and, you know, in, in, in my view, uh, well, uh, the larger you get is you get from the sort of local to the county to the state to the national level. Uh, the um, the political lift in order to pass a law there is is um, is heavier and heavier and heavier. Um, and you know I think probably <laughs> at the national level the, the political lift uh, uh, in the recent uh, past and, and and the immediate future is like infinite, right? Like there, there's there's no uh, there's no uh, possibility that it would happen. Um, and given given that I think that uh, you know we all need to be thinking about uh, the fact that putting in place laws that protect people. Is kind of like is is necessary, and uh, you know that we should, um, as a result, expect uh, and accept uh, some uh, balkanization of the regulatory environment for companies uh, as a result of the fact that um, that our you know the, the national government isn't likely to act on a lot of these issues. Um, even state governments are unlikely to act. Um, I think for for uh, similar uh, reasons um, relating to corporate influence over uh, state legislatures. Uh, and so increasingly, uh, the place where policymaking can happen, and I think it's actually quite sophisticated, thoughtful policymaking, um, is the local level. So I, the only, I, I don't disagree with anything that, you, that you've said. I would say, though, that at the local level, my guess is that people, there are technologies and applications for data, particularly on the, and putting aside industry, just on the government side, that there are things that, civil servants could do with data that would make transportation better, that would make the streets safer, that would make smart cities better. I mean, good, good, useful uses, right? Um, but if they're prohibited to do so because there's a very, you know, for whatever reason, something bad happened or, you know, some someone gets, you know, gets concerned, um, th they don't have the big budgets, they don't have the, you know, they, they, they don't often have people who are out there pushing for things. And that's those are the people that's going to get hurt, and, and that's and I think that's probably happening. I, I but and so I just I understand what you're saying, and you're right. It's it's partly as Stacy has said a number of times. We need something at a national level to sort of have those discussions and to think those through and give everyone an opportunity to play. But at the local level, I don't think those discussions are taking place with the same level of of vigor and education and understanding. That's my sense. 
I, that's that's a. Um, I, I also agree with that. Uh, I, you know, there are some things I think which might be prohibited at the local level, but I also don't want to discount the things that are possible at the local level without using, um, uh, you know, really identifiable um, um, granular location information or other kinds of information that that it corresponds to individuals. Um, and, and just to sort of like lay out a few of those, because I think it's it's worth um, being specific um, with respect to, to micro mobility, like scooters and bikes, there's a huge uh, important policy goal of making sure that those um, those modes of transportation are available equitably uh, across the city and not that scooters and bikes are just in rich neighborhoods and not in poor neighborhoods, um, because those represent in some instances a low cost, uh, a lower cost way of getting to work, for example, um, that, that those communities might not otherwise have. Um, there's also a really important goal of making sure that uh, that public rights of way are free from obstruction uh, to make sure that disabled people um, can use sidewalks and and uh, crosswalks and such, and that those aren't aren't interfered with by by um, scooters and bikes. Uh, and then there's of course the 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 um, something that's been mentioned a few times, which is where do you put roads, where do you put bike paths, um, and things like that. Um, where do you put uh, stores? Um, all of those goals, um, I think, can be achieved without having highly granular, uh, maximum precision location data about individual trips. Um, for building a bike path, for example, you can aggregate um, a whole bunch of trips together and not have any individual um, be identifiable. Um, and you can do pretty robust uh, uh, aggregation, uh, and you can still find out where populations are, are moving and you're not identifying people. Um, with respect to things like disability or with respect to um, uh, equitable distribution of, of micro mobility uh, that can be done uh, without knowing anything about any individual trip, uh, but just where scooters are left when no person is on them. And so I think that the solution here is to think about the goal at the outset and then uh, design a process, um, including access to information, which minimizes the privacy harms. And I think a lot of public policy goals are possible if you do that. Um, it does take uh, more thought and, and and more time, but I think you can get both the the sort of praiseworthy policy goals and also the privacy um, if you if you do the process right. That was a great discussion back and forth. Um, don't want to cut it off. Does anybody else want to chime in on that? No, I I totally agree with everything Jake just said. Um, I'm interested in sort of the challenge when you have multiple different private companies that are all sort of collecting similar data. I think um, what you can use aggregate information, you can use more limited types of information to serve the policy goals uh, without requiring that those companies transmit precise geolocation data to a central government entity. But uh, if you start having aggregate analysis from three or four different private entities, how do you make comparisons uh, between those within a city, right? And how do you ensure that it's all accurate, right? So one uh, interesting solution, I and mean, we're, we're seeing more and more data trusts, you know, companies that are formed specifically to sort of collate individually identifiable data from different sources and ag aggregate it together and then provide analysis to the government entity. Um, that might be a potential solution here, but without that, I mean, this is what the this is what LADOT or others in the same sort of situation would probably say, right? We want to be able to make comparisons like between all of these different companies. We want to be able to check our work and not have to rely on the tech companies who, after all, have that individual identifiable raw data to begin with. So it's just a question of which entity you trust. People don't am, trust I, am I characterizing? <laughs> You would, I totally agree. Yeah, maybe I'm not characterizing that correctly. I don't know. No, no, I think you did actually very well. Okay. Um, so a uh, couple other questions, and and I know we're revisiting. I mean, you guys have gotten. I think um, you've touched a lot of the big issues. So I feel like I'm just asking you to go a little deeper on this de-anonymization here, given what we know about the ability to de-anonymize, right? Uh, mobile location data. With relative ease, what are the legal responsibility of, and maybe ethical responsibilities? I don't know. Uh, responsibilities of location data resellers. You know, it, is that well defined mm -hmm. in the law? Does it need to be well defined in the law? Do we need to have a list of them that uh, have a green check on Angie's list, and the other ones don't? Like, um, you know, because I mean, I'm a tech guy, and I know if, if you throw enough geo nerds at something, they're going to solve the problem. And if you give them the you know, 
the task of enriching the data um, so that, you know, it's de-anonymized, they just do it, you know, and they're just, they're just doing what the boss tells them to do. So, um, you know, we're also, you know, working, uh, uh, AGS, Ethical Geo Initiative is working with the, uh, our friends at the Geovation Center in London, um, uh, their benchmark initiative on, a, on an international location charter. And this is a big issue, right? You know, what are the best practices? What are the principles? What are the guidelines that we should be asking all companies to live by? And are they just ethical guidelines or should they be in the law? So I know I asked like 12 questions in there. That was more of a manifesto and a rant than a question, but uh, does anybody want to uh, chime in on that? Stacy, go ahead. It's a great question. And I'm seeing some of the, uh, the Q and a chat with it, which I, I don't know if all attendees can see, can nope. see that Chris, but all, there's, there's some, can. I can, yes. Go ahead. There's some questions being, uh, being thrown in around whether we anticipate anonymized or aggregated data to be exempted from a forthcoming privacy law, location data law or other privacy law. Right. And yeah, probably, um, probably not anonymous location data in the way that industry has been using that term for the last you know, 10, 15 years, but truly de-identified, truly aggregated data analysis is typically not considered to have privacy risks. Um, but it is worth broadening the scope of the question a little bit beyond identifiability because there's also sensitivity and there are ways that location data can be used that doesn't necessarily identify someone but can still be unexpected or potentially harmful and I, and I think a good example of that is um this case out of massachusetts from a few years ago around geofencing abortion clinics so that the advertising intermediary could send content to people who whose phones had been detected to be in those locations um you know encouraging them not to get an abortion or whatever it is just send content to the phones that have been in a particular place that can be done without re-identifying anyone or knowing the identity of anyone or even using data that doesn't uh, that isn't persistent over time because you can send a geofenced alert at a point in time without even necessarily collecting the location data right uh, but it's clearly a harmful use case right it got banned by the attorney general in that state and it's, it's i don't know of any company that would do something like that right but i do know that most companies are thinking through similar types of situations around how they should deal with data around schools clinics right um dispensaries and other sorts of you know church mosques political events um in ways that don't necessarily identify the person but have to do with the use of that data for further things do we want to receive politically targeted ads on our phones based on the fact that we went to a rally the week before, right? So these are ethical issues that I think are still being sorted out. Um, and on, uh, on the anonymization question, the question is whether this is gonna be addressed by, by a law, Chris? Sorry, yeah. I went yeah, off on if sensitive. You, if, you think, if you think one's uh, coming or who's working on it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, th there are some methods to, to legitimately, from what I understand at a technical level, and I'm not a technologist, right? There are some methods that can adequately de-identify or anonymize data to within an acceptable level of risk. Um, or to right, eliminate all risk, Differential risks, right? privacy, statistical methods. Differential right. privacy, adding statistical noise, redacting the dwell locations where a device is located at night. Um, redacting uh, sensitivity, re making the data less precise. You can toggle the precision to make it less precise. You can go to a city level rather than a street corner uh, level. Um, you can take a look at the persistence, right? Maybe you don't need the every 10 seconds for you know a developer app to be pinging for location data. Maybe it's enough every day or every half hour or whatever. Right? So there are all these different ways that. You kind of reduce risk, including through administrative safeguards, right? We saw problems with rideshare companies in recent years where uh, there was access to a God mode in, in one of them famously, right? Where people could see where all of the devices were going in real time. That's, I, I can't imagine a situation where that's gonna be necessary, right? So you need administrative access controls within a company so that people can't look people up. 
Um, all of these things go into identifiability and risk management. Uh, Chris, so go ahead, Kevin. I see you want to chime in. Yeah, a couple couple thoughts. Um, in terms of the the um, you know, what the data broker, if you will, for lack of a better word. I mean, I, I do. I believe it was the Vermont data broker law that referenced location information in the recitals, but didn't actually include it in the definition in the in the law itself, which I thought was was interesting. Um, I do think, though, that that you know there will we will see more of that, and and the challenge will be, as we've talked about, how do you define that, right? I mean, as a what, companies have so much location information and are using it in so many different ways. How do you how do you define it? Someone is and in Vermont. There's a requirement to to register, but there could be other requirements that you impose on that. Um, so I do think there's a real a real challenge with that. Um, I'm not a technologist either, and I, I don't fully understand. I, I read different reports about what, how easy or difficult it is to anonymize certain certain data sets and to identify a particular person, and and I don't. You know, I, I, I think that's going to be a really tough question, and and I do I do think it's going to take an answer, combination of law and policy and technical folks and operational folks to come up with a solution that addresses the the risk because it it really varies, and that's one of the other aspects of location privacy. Um, you know, it covers so many different risks, right? I mean, it, it's it's so it can be used in so many different ways, whether it be someone stalking you, whether it's someone <clears throat> making decisions about your insurance. Or in the geofencing case that Stacy mentioned, I mean, there's so many different different aspects to that. Um, as you and I have talked about, you know, around ethics versus the law, I think this community is so large. I think it involves so many different groups and, and professions and industries and technologies that that who who do the ethics ethical guidelines apply to, and how do you how do you not enforce them, but how do you even get any sort of you know, buy in to to all these different different groups. And I and I know the open source community is dealing with that on software and licenses and how do you enforce a license that maybe requires someone to use their software for, for an ethical use or not to use it for things that are unethical. I mean, the challenge is is very significant. So for me, um, you know, you need to start and think with the law and then build ethics around it, maybe around particularly segments of the group, the the geospatial community. Or particular applications, but a broader set of um, practices, I just find really, really problematic, particularly when you try to do it on an international scale. Um, so, um, who's what are the prospects of a new US federal location privacy law? That may be the wrong question. Um, and Who's thinking about it? Like, who has a draft sitting on their hard drive because that's what they do at night when they're watching Netflix? Like, you know, uh, who who's thinking about this sort of thing? <laughs> Stacy, you you lit up your mic. You're the first one. You win. Do you? Uh, have, is it you are you the one? <laughs> uh, I wish I or I would copy and paste half of the GDPR and just. <laughs> um, no, I, I people are definitely thinking about it. Okay, so so um, both. Well, and Senator Wicker on the Senate Commerce Committee, the, the chair and, and ranking minority member, are thinking very hard about this and have location baked into their comprehensive privacy bills from way back when, you know, to 2019 before COVID changed everything. Um, those are still on the table. I mean, really, where a lot of the political will, I guess, fell apart were around non privacy issues. It was really, really about preemption and how the law would be enforced. Uh, which impacts the business community in a big way, but it's it, it's not really there was consensus on a lot of the underlying privacy restrictions that ought to exist. Um, Senator Wyden is certainly thinking about this. So it's been reported that Senator Wyden and his staff are drafting a bill that would um, restrict law enforcement agencies from purchasing location data as an end run around getting a warrant, which should I would expect to get bipartisan support, right? That's that's a very clear thing uh, that that there isn't much disagreement amongst even even amongst ad tech companies that are uh, in some cases providing that data. They agree. So so yeah, it's it's definitely being thought about. I I don't know that I anticipate a location privacy law. Um, it could happen. 
Um, but the sectoral laws that I see more momentum around at the federal level are around biometrics and health data. Um, I'd be surprised to see a location privacy law because it just gets into this kind of rabbit hole of a question of how do you define location and how do you make principal distinctions between location and other types of privacy intrusions uh, into private life when they're not based on latitude, longitude, or GPS, right? Um, and how do you enable all of the good things while, you know, restricting others? Um, and whether notice and choice is, is even the right. So lots of people thinking about it, but I would expect it to become part of uh, a baseline consumer privacy law in the next four years rather than a standalone. Great, Kevin, I saw you uh, lean forward. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I agree with with uh, what Stacy was saying. I mean, there, there's been location type um, location has been included in privacy law drafts for federal privacy legislation for probably eight or nine years now, right? It widens been been pushing it, and others have as well. Marky, I think, had something a number of years ago. I mean, it's been it's been around. Um, I, I will tell you that one thing I, I say, and, and I agree, I don't think there's going to be a location privacy law at the federal level. And that's partly going to be a problem because I don't think a lot of aspects of the geospatial community who, who are collecting and using data are they they they're not following it, right? They see it as a federal mm -hmm. privacy law. So they don't they don't focus on that. And so the discussion is being taking place around some of the other issues and location is either not being adequately discussed. Or defined and it's sort of moving through, you know, the system now, maybe because of COVID-19 and some of the other things we're talking about, that'll change. But I, that's, that's been something I've observed that if it doesn't say, you know, geospatial information, we're going to stop this privacy law, then people, people aren't part of that discussion. And that's, that's an issue. I, I did Stacey, I did want to ask you though, um, because I think it's a, it's a fair point that, that it's really hard to have something like location privacy like you do with facial recognition mm -hmm. or biometric, but don't you have still have those same challenges that you describe, even if you embed it into a federal privacy law? I mean, you still have to define it. You still have to, <laughs> you still have to deal with those. Um, you're just yeah. not dealing with standalone. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the most common way that I see location being incorporated into the both, both proposals and the bills that have been introduced is by sticking it into a section on sensitive data. So there's not 100%, but fairly good consensus that most privacy laws should include some form of heightened restrictions around sensitive types of data, which is usually political affiliation, you know, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, religion. Um, and by heightened restrictions, that usually looks like opt-in affirmative consent, and then some combination of other uh, restrictions, data protection impact assessments, for example. Most, uh, most of the time I see location data just sort of stuck into that list as a sensitive category of information. And it makes a certain amount of sense because the Federal Trade Commission, for example, has said that location data is a sensitive category of information. Location can certainly reveal a lot of sensitive information, right? You have persistent location, you can infer someone's religious affiliation or their political affiliation. Um, based on where they're going and their, their characteristics and their habits. So it makes a certain amount of sense, but um, I think one of the challenges is that it isn't always amenable to affirmative consent. Right. Um, nor is affirmative consent always good enough, frankly, from an advocacy point of view, right? It, do we want to live in a world where you just have to like check yes to everything, right? So if you do it wrong, consent can be this wheel, unwieldy, um, insufficient safeguard to begin with. But aside from the problems with that, it's not practically possible in a lot of situations with location data. Uh, so it's possible in the mobile app space uh, and you could get to a really good legal regime for mobile app and mobile app developers and their partners. Uh, but what about location collected from wearables, location collected from IoT don't have screens uh, location based on the identifiers emitted from connected vehicles. Um, what do you do with uh, license plates and facial recognition and everything else? One solution, you just ban all of that, right? But that's maybe more of a reasonable approach in facial recognition for 
the reasons Jake talked about, but for everything else, MAC addresses, license plates, everything where there isn't a screen and you really can't give affirmative consent, or maybe it's a family device, right? Um, then an affirmative consent rule is just going to make all of those use cases practically impossible. So what we what we see in the EU around location data is it's been kind of bifurcated. So some location data under EU law requires affirmative opt-in consent, usually when it's done through mobile apps, right? Um, and they're sort of developing on that, but they've taken a couple of actions against location marketing companies. Um, the French DPA, the CNIL, has taken a lot of action here. Uh, but there's another subset of location data, which is data sets based off of the mobile identifiers that are emitted from phones, so MAC addresses. Um, this is companies like JC Deco and Bumby Labs in Sweden. Um, the Dutch DPA has been very involved in this. So when you're talking about airports, stadiums, and retailers who are sweeping via their Wi-Fi networks usually for the identifiers coming from phones, you can either not do that at all, which is one approach, right? If you are going to do it to a certain extent because you believe that there is value in physical spaces being able to know where how people are moving, um, you can't base it on consent because it's not technically possible. You're going through a screen, right? You're, these are the identifiers that are being given off and you're collecting them. Um, so what well, what's the right approach there? And under the EU, it's been uh, those companies have used a legitimate interest lawful basis rather than a consent lawful basis. And what that means is they do a complex balancing test where they say, okay, there is value to doing this. You do have a business interest in knowing how people are moving around in a space, uh, but there's an intrusion upon privacy because these are persistent identifiers. So if you're going to do it and if it's going to be legal, you have to immediately anonymize, delete the data after 24 hours, and you can't track people over time. You can track them within a day, and maybe one day, maybe two day, maybe it's all sort of a little arbitrary, the time frame, but short term, okay, aggregate analysis, okay, but you can't keep the identifiers and you can't track people over time. Um, and that's a judicially created balancing outcome, not based on consent. I think it's a good outcome. Um, and I think we'll see more of that for things like that, like connected vehicles or any other context where you can't get consent. So, very long answer. Sorry. No, it, it's, um, it's, it's it's but it, it it highlights the point that that one people are looking at location as being sensitive in many instances, and there's a heightened scrutiny. Um, and as you said, you applying you know some of the fair information practice principles um, even more strictly, even though they may not apply to location information for lots of the different, or they may not be the best the best way for location information, right? So there's that challenge. And then it gets to understanding the technology and the applications at a granular enough level so that you can apply them differently, whether it be through regulation or legislation or the courts or whomever. And that's that's the type of discussion that you know we're not having here now. I I don't think, and Stacy knows better than than me. But you know we're not having that type of discussion here now. And but you know things are working through the system, whether it be court cases or whether they be um, legislation or bans or whatever it is. And, and that's, yeah. that's, that's what we're facing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. The level of discourse in the US is dramatically higher than where it was a year ago, but I think it's still not, not high enough that uh, people who are really technical experts and, and geospatial scientists um, who should feel comfortable that we're not gonna end up with a law that uh, Unintentionally uh, hinders a lot of really good legitimate use cases. But Jake, or it doesn't impact the bad use cases, right? Right. Exactly. So. Yep. Yep. I just wanted to, to to jump in about the issue of because I think there, um, uh, you know, like at the at the ACLU of Northern California, we've long resisted uh, drawing distinctions in privacy laws between sensitive information and non-sensitive personal information. Um, there's kind of two two reasons for that. One is that um, that distinction um, is in many cases a justification for reducing the privacy protection associated with quote unquote non-sensitive personal information. 
Um, and so it's a it's a sort of a distinction created in order to reduce protections for certain kinds of information. So that's that's one thing. The question that we would ask is like, why not protect everything um, with with strong protections? But um, as at a kind of substantive level, I, I think it's worth kind of being clear minded about what information that is collected about all of us um, is actually non sensitive. I mean, the categories of sensitive information that uh, are often um, specified are health information, financial information, you know, sometimes uh, geolocation information, um, uh, things like that. And if you think about all of the information that is gathered as we use mobile devices, you know, our, our, our laptops, um, uh, computers, um, et cetera, like um, sensitive information is often inferable from uh, a lot of that information, and you know, th there's there's some aspects of this these kinds of claims which are pseudoscience. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of claims being made that people's emotional states or their uh, or or like uh, mental illnesses or or like emotional or psychological vulnerabilities can be um, inferred from uh, you know the details of how they interact with a website uh, or something. Um, I think some whether, of that whether is or not they have COVID nineteen. Exactly <laughs> that too. Some of that is is, is pseudoscience, um, or at least not justified yet. But I think some of it uh, is real. And just to sort of be specific, um, you know, uh, Stacy talked about how um, location information, if you go to a clinic or um, or, or a place of worship, can reveal um, uh, sensitive personal information. That's certainly true of our browsing activity, right? I, I think probably all of us uh, have searched for a medical condition that we uh, were concerned that we or a family member. Uh, potentially had or search for symptoms that we had in, in, in looking for uh, some kind of like hint as the diagnosis. Um, uh, search history, browsing activity, uh, certainly private communications like messages, uh, emails, um, or, or even uh, even the metadata associated with those communications, um, I think could uh, reflect sensitive personal information as it's defined. Um, and then uh, one example that I, I found uh, sort of terrifying is there's a, there's a, a Uber actually has a patent uh, uh, application based on detecting whether somebody is intoxicated uh, based on their use of a mobile app. And I think, you know, it's not crazy to think that somebody who um, is intoxicated is going to use a mobile application differently and that that difference is going to be detectable by the application itself. Um, but if you do that and that is possible, then the sort of like how someone scrolls or how someone taps on their mobile phone could actually be an indicator of alcoholism. Um, or other kinds of health conditions. And so I think the distinction between sensitive and non-sensitive personal information is kind of like blurry and porous at best. Um, and so I haven't seen a uh, distinction between those two categories that uh, takes that porousness seriously. And for that reason, I think it's better to have a single category of strong protection for personal information. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, we've had so many references to health. We haven't really discussed health specifically. Um, one of our um, uh, ethical geo fellows, uh, 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 Father Michael Rozier uh, from St. Louis University, I guess he's also a professor, Michael Rozier, um, you know, he always gives the, the example of HIPAA, you know, where all of your health data is uh, protected by HIPAA. But the mobile location data that shows that you walked into an AIDS clinic at 10 a.m. on Tuesday isn't isn't protected by HIPAA at all, um, and could be picked up, you know, by any ad tech company and resold to whoever. So, you know, that's kind of an interesting issue. We do have a, a question came in from uh, the audience, you know, about specifically, you know, health data. I think their it, it, their concern is, you know, what are the effects of government reliance on private contractors and companies to manage geolocation and health data. But I mean, you could twist that question two or three other ways, you know, when, when there's a big marketplace of that location data from it could be inferred your health status or your concerns about your health status or whatever, you know, what are the public and private access issues around that? Um, do, do you, and you just covered that, Jake. Does anybody else want to chime in on health, uh, maybe the health dimension of this, or is it just, Good enough that we noted it for the audience because it is not protected by HIPAA. Uh, I'll, I'll leave Stacy's thoughtful nod. Well, that, that's a good question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, uh, Jake's example uh, around the patent for whether you're intoxicated kind of 
gets you into also thinking about behavioral biometrics, which is kind of a fascinating thing. I think it turns out that the way that we use our phone and the way that we're standing and like the way that you type can also be used as an identifier, at least in the short term, um, a method of biometric identification, which is really, really interesting. I'm going to do a, a couple more questions as we bring this to the end. I think you guys have uh, helped us uncover so many issues. Um, there's a great question that came in from a uh, Facebook Live audience. When lawyers and policymakers are writing policies and regulations to ensure citizens and consumer privacy, is big tech at the table? Or I guess I'd say, I'm sure they are, but in what ways is big tech uh, at the table uh, to help explain the technology to the policymakers and the, the lawyers? And what incentives do big tech have in providing that information if it's really gonna just make it harder for them to use the data or sell that location data? Do, they, do you have a vested interest in not educating policymakers and lawyers? Um, or, or do you see them being pretty <laughs> forthcoming and, you know, um, I don't like to say on the offensive, but being proactive in, in helping educate uh, people? And I do wanna broaden that, I mean, beyond Apple and Google, you know, people that sell phones, you know, there's people who sell drones and they're satellite companies and, you know, which parts of the landscape, tech landscape are being proactive and helpful and which ones aren't? Uh, Good one. I, so, I, first of all, no, I don't think that there's a vested interest in not educating policymakers. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, everyone's best interest that policymakers and lawmakers particularly are well informed and know what they're doing. Um, I think one of the challenges that I've seen is um, companies, especially larger companies, just tend to have a, a divide between their technical experts and their product experts, product engineers, and their lobbyists or public policy experts or the people that are willing or able or designated to go in and talk to policymakers. Um, sometimes that's just bureaucratic. Sometimes it's self-interest. I, I know a lot of companies, for instance, are, are, are very hesitant to go talk to the FTC, for example, even though they could probably do a lot of good. Uh, because they're sitting in a room with a regulator and if they say the wrong thing or they feel like if they say the wrong thing they're going to bring scrutiny and attention down on them um so you know same same with going into like talking to policymakers. so you often get things that are just talking points and then you also get things that sound like talking points even though there's real legitimate technical expertise behind it to justify that point um, but ends up sounding like a talking point to a policymaker who is just because the person that they're talking to doesn't have the technical background, right? So um, my advice to companies is usually just to, to make sure there's as much um, cross-pollination and, and discussion internally within the company as possible so that the policy experts are as well as well informed as they absolutely can be um, so they can inform lawmakers. Um, that's yeah, I, I, I just to jump in. I, I agree with that, and I, I think that um, that there is a lot of helpful information that comes from uh, from technology companies uh, with respect to how um, how the laws will um, will affect the technology that's used, and then just sort of what's happening on the ground. Um, I, I and I think it's, it's it's really important for that that product expertise, the market expertise, and the technical expertise to be brought to bear on the policy making process. Um, I, I will I will add that in my experience there there's often this notion that like well there's a privileging of uh, people with uh, deep technical expertise in these conversations that I think is is a little bit um, is is not been borne out in my experience um, I mean in, at the ACLU we have uh, technologists who uh, who who work um, on on the the speech uh, privacy and technology team in, in at, at ACLU National. Um, EFF has technologists uh, that are on staff. They both build tools and also uh, advise on, on policy questions. Um, and uh, there can be, you know, fairly widespread agreement with respect to like the like deeper technical details and then uh, vast disagreement about what the right policy answer is. And I think that is often a result of the fact that um, that while technical expertise is important, it actually it, it's, it's sort of underdeterminative in the sense that having a technical understanding does not answer the policy question for you. Um, what has, you need in order to answer the policy question 
um, is is policy judgment and to decide you know which communities to protect, whose interests to favor. Um, and there, I think you uh, get into uh, a very a much more murky area um, where the incentives of the particular legislator, the policymaker, et cetera, come into play. Um, and you know the priorities of the regulator if you're talking about the FTC. Um, and so, yeah, technical expertise doesn't answer uh, uh, policy questions as a general matter, although it is a very important input to those policy questions. I, I agree with that, and I'll say maybe the well. A potentially bigger problem is less having the technical expertise and more having the knowledge of the business models and the data flows uh, involved in the modern ecosystem. The, the internet transactions, for example, how they work, how social media platforms work, and what those data flows really look like, because most lawmakers are considering um, not just the privacy implications of a law that they might write, but the economic implications. and in my mind, it's very challenging to write any kind of privacy law that isn't going to impact some private sector industries, some public sector industries, some business models, and not other business models. So if you're concerned about antitrust or if you're just concerned that you're going to accidentally like wipe out the ad-supported internet, we're going to force us all to paywalls right, or cookie banners, um, those are legitimate concerns. You have to understand the business models in order to make policy judgments about which ones you're okay impacting or eliminating and what that process is going to look like and whether it's going to be um, supplemented by more privacy innovation and new and different types of business models that are going to be more privacy protective. And this is just coming from my advertising background, right? This is at the crux of most most privacy law proposals we see. Yeah, and that's uh, yeah. So so to follow up on that, because I think Stacy made a couple of excellent points. I, I think I think with location in general, the issue is that most of it is still wrapped up in the advertising discussion, and many of the big companies mm -hmm. that are at the table are looking at it from an advertising standpoint, and they're their trade-offs, their understanding, their business models are different than many others that are using location technology. But because for a lot of those businesses, one, they're smaller, or they're in, consider themselves in different sectors, so they aren't necessarily part of the same trade associations or going to the same meetings or going even before the same committees, right? Because that's, that's an important part. Their voice isn't isn't being heard, or they're not contributing to the to the discussion. And and so a lot of the mm -hmm. folks, Chris, that you and I know, that are big players, if you will, in the geospatial community, um, they're 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 looking at you know other matters that are more important to them, and they're not focusing on on privacy. And so they're not part of the discussion. They're not, as a question said, at the table helping them explain the technology. And as Stacy said, point. You know, this is what's going to happen. If you do X, this is what's going to do to us. And maybe you want to do that. Maybe from a policy standpoint, that's fine. But the unintended consequences are X, Y, and Z. And that discussion, I'm not sure, is taking place as well as it could around location, privacy in general. Right. Yeah, I agree. And companies have to be more forthright about it, too. I mean, from most company representatives or trade association representatives we speak to are not willing to say, uh, you know, here here's the, the slice of business practices that are more risky and more privacy invasive, and here are the ones that are less. Um, and here's how we can make some principal distinctions about what a privacy law might impact, because it's not it's not in their self-interest. They'd rather just say no to um, Right. But that's not going to create practical ways forward. Right. Um, so as we wind down uh, toward the top of the hour, um, you know, it's a confusing landscape, and you know I've got three uh, you know experienced lawyers here who you know have come from different parts of the space. If I'm a a, a lawyer and I'm interested in this stuff, um, where should I get involved? I mean, other than you know FPF, the Center for Spatial Law and Policy, and uh, the ACLU, right? I mean, obviously they should be members of all three. Um, but if I'm a, a lawyer, an active lawyer out there, or maybe a law student coming up uh, through the ranks, and I think this is the future, who sh where should I be involved? What should I be tuned into? 
Um, uh, who yeah. should I be following other than you three? Um, what, what kind of guidance can you give uh, folks in the legal community? Hmm. Um, yeah, join join FPF for sure. We have law firm members that are part of our community and our advisory board. Um, if you're starting out, I think in your career, you're a new lawyer. I think that the IPP can be a great resource um, uh, in the membership community. That. What's the IPP? The International Association of Privacy Professionals. Okay. Um, this is mostly uh, in in-house uh, general counsels and practicing privacy professionals at companies and law firm members, and and a lot of it's been. Uh, it's been professionalized, right? So there's a certification test and all of these things. It's, I think, a very different world than uh, the advocacy world where you're looking at organizations like Epic and ACLU and EFF, which are, which also have a lot of activity that they're doing. Um, any number of these things are great ways to get involved. Uh, Jay, oh yeah, go ahead, Kevin. No, I was just, I was, I, mean, I agree. IEPP is a good, is a good resource. Um, I think the legal community is, I'd, I'd say woefully unaware of the legal and policy issues around data in general. And I include privacy is certainly part of that data protection, but intellectual property rights, data quality and liability issues, the national security issues. I mean, I, I think I think there's a whole set of law and you and I have talked about them before. I mean, I think that's I think that's where, you know, more lawyers need to be paying attention to. And that's involved. You know, that's some product liability, some intellectual property, certainly privacy, but those set of issues and, and to Stacy's point and Jake's point, understanding how data goes into an organization, how it's used, what the ecosystem, how it comes out, whether it be location or whether it be medical or health is, is going to be increasingly important, um, both for the public and private sector. So, and, and you know, th th there are, you know, there are different, pro there's no sort of course of study. I don't think you can go to do that now. But within you know the ABA or IAPP or International Bar Association, others, there are folk you can take. You can go to classes and take things on the legal side, in addition to sort of outside of that, you know, with industry groups and things to really learn how those industries are collecting, using, sharing, and storing data. Yeah, I, 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 those are all uh, really great suggestions, and I, I completely agree with them. I, I would add. Um, uh, you know, thinking about uh, pursuing opportunities uh, in inside of regulators. Um, I spent uh, almost mm -hmm. five years as an attorney at the FTC. Um, I actually did uh, a little bit of privacy, but not very much. I focused largely on uh, on consumer protection, uh, like false advertising cases and antitrust um, mergers. But um, just being at the FTC uh, and seeing how the agency operates, even if you're not doing you know work inside the division, the division of privacy and identity protection. Uh, that is the kind of sort of core privacy regulator within the FTC. You're going to see those cases. You're going to see how the agency works, and I think it's really helpful to understand how um, the privacy um, regulation works inside that agency. State AGs, I think, are also a, a really great place. Um, obviously, the California AG is currently enforcing the CCPA, um, but there are other um, state AGs that do privacy law enforcement either through their their unfair and deceptive practices statutes or potentially through new state level privacy laws, even if those state level privacy laws are, are more sectoral than, than like the CCPA might be. Um, uh, like, you know, Kevin mentioned the Vermont data broker law or the main ISP privacy law. Um, there are a lot of state level privacy laws that are enforced by state AGs, which are uh, a little bit narrower than a, than a broad based uh, consumer privacy law, but I think are also really uh, great places to get experience um, with, 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 with privacy law. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, in-house um, is, I think, a really great place for people who are early in their careers uh, and, and late, later in their careers as well uh, to gain uh, um, deep uh, market knowledge and product knowledge, uh, and then also um, uh, legal expertise around what um, rules are in place. And um, I, I think that's one where the sort of the market for lawyers is very good. Um, there are a lot of in-house opportunities uh, for uh, for privacy lawyers and uh, trust and safety lawyers, um, and so I think that's a place to to keep in mind as well for people who are earlier. Yeah. Much. Um, uh, you know, we started with kind of COVID nineteen and contact tracing, and we've covered far afield from that. Uh, I mean, clearly the implications for what it is uh, happened before COVID nineteen um is shaping how we respond to COVID-19 and what we put in place during COVID-19 will shape our uh response to whatever the next exigency is um 
I really want to thank you for uh, giving us your time today. I know, you know, your time is probably your most, uh, you know, precious resource. So thanks for sharing it with us in the community. Um, uh, you know, the uh, AGS um, isn't normally where uh, lawyers uh, come and hang out, but maybe we need to start a law and geo drinking club. Uh, well, I guess it would all be virtual happy hours uh, right now. Um, but I certainly feel like after time with you, I could uh, play a lawyer on TV, at least as like a, a bit part on Law & Order for a few minutes. Um, so thank you for your time and expertise. I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank um, our audience for taking a couple hours out of their uh, time to join Miss Stacy Gray, Mr. Kevin Pomfret, and uh, uh, Jake Snow. Um, and I would be remiss if I did not thank our sponsor, Henry Luce Foundation. Uh, without uh, their support, none of this would be possible. And we believe uh, that their support has enabled a very important uh, dialogue that uh, is educating all of us. Before I leave you to your weekend, I just want to point out, um, not only have we had many sessions in the past that if you go to ethicalgeo.org and click on Location Tech Task Force, you can view all of those recorded sessions. Um, but we have a, uh, another session uh, coming up on uh, September 8th. Um, tracking uh, movement through space during COVID-19 and beyond. So um, uh, we'd love to have you tune in and stay with us on all of our future events. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us and have a wonderful weekend. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Chris. Thanks thank so much. You.